Hey everyone, welcome back. This is part two of my rebuttal of Pastor Mike Winger's series on Catholicism. So I apologize for the delay in this video. I'm trying to get them all out before I head off to Australia. So I want to keep at least weekly videos on this channel, if not more than that, but juggling that with the podcast, which you should check out at trendhornpodcast.com, by the way, to support it and to help us keep making videos like this. So let's jump into it right now. Pastor Mike is talking about the authority of the Catholic Church, specifically the papacy, he just got done talking about Tertullian. Now he's going to get into Saint Cyprian of Carthage, the bishop of North Africa in the early uh, third, in the early to mid third century. Cyprian, he presided over the Seventh Council of Carthage, and he said this: another one of the Church Fathers. For neither does any of us set himself up as bishop of bishops, nor by tyrannical terror does any compel his colleague other bishops. The necessity of obedience, since every bishop, according to the allowance of his liberty and power, has his own proper right of judgment and can no more be judged by any man than he himself can judge another. So the point is that Cyprian is saying, hey, each of the bishops or the, the leaders of the different churches is accountable to God. And you can't tell that. You can't go over here and say, I'm going to tell this church what they need to do and need to not do and this and that. God's raised up that leader. That leader is accountable to God. There is no central one guy that's in charge of everybody. And this is, uh, this is important to Roman Catholic theology because Cyprian, the guy who says there's no one bishop above the rest, he is the same guy who is one of the few who thinks that Peter was the rock in Matthew 16. But how could he think Peter's the rock and not think that that means Peter's the Pope? Because he thought every one of them was the rock. He thought every leader carried that was now the rock on which the church was built. And that, do you see how it, it, this doesn't sound like Roman Catholic theology? And it's not. It's not historically accurate. Okay, let's talk about St. Cyprian then. Uh, Cyprian most certainly did believe in the primacy of the Roman See. That was a foundational element for the unity of the church in Cyprian's work on the unity of the church. In there, he says, a primacy is given to Peter, whereby it is made clear that there is but one church and one chair. That doesn't mean there's only one bishop, though. Uh, so another point to make up, however, is that the church fathers are not inspired scripture. So they're human beings. They're fallible. Uh, they can also be contradictory. And the Eastern Orthodox theologian Nicholas Afansiev says that Cyprian does contradict himself. Like Tertullian, earlier in his uh, episcopate, Cyprian was a big fan of, of the Pope, a huge cheerleader for Roman primacy. When the Pope agreed with him and backed him up in his disputes with uh, different people in Carthage and in North Africa. But then when the Pope disagreed with Cyprian, suddenly Cyprian downplayed Roman authority. He never completely rejected it, but he, he didn't mention it as overtly. He disagreed over the valid baptism of heretics, that there were these lapsi, these priests who had fallen into persecution and renounced the Christian faith, but were still performing baptisms. And, and Cyprian said their, their baptisms aren't valid. And Pope Stephen said, no, they, they are valid. And so they butted heads over this. Pope Stephen's view, by the way, is the true view. That's what's won out today in the Church. That's what is correct that has been preserved to us through the Church's magisterium, through—that's why we have the Bishop of Rome to preserve these true teachings, that we know more explicitly now the sacraments are ex opere operato. They are valid in and of themselves. So even if a minister of the sacrament is sinful, it doesn't mean the sacrament is not efficacious. So if your priest is in mortal sin— and he validly celebrates Mass, that's Jesus in the Eucharist. If your priest is in mortal sin, uh, well, depending on the—there's some canon law situations that are unique to confession, but in general, if your priest is in a state of mortal sin and absolves you in the confessional, you're absolved. So his sanctity doesn't affect the validity of the sacraments if he follows the proper form and the proper matter associated with the sacraments. And so Afonsiev, who's an Eastern Orthodox theologian, says that Cyprian, regardless over everything that he said, that Cyprian said that a place was given by the Rome, to the Roman Church did raise it above the harmonious multitude. So all the bishops are legitimate bishops. The Pope is not one super bishop who tells all the other bishops everything they have to do, and they're his little puppets. That's not how the episcopate works. They have legitimate authority to teach and can teach for their local magisterium in their diocese, archdiocese, patriarch, metropolitan, whatever it may be. But the Pope has legitimate authority to be able to intervene amongst the different churches, and we see that all throughout church history, and Cyprian recognized it and asked for the Pope's authority to intervene in various cases. He just didn't like it when the Pope would intervene against him sometimes. But all the evidence points towards Cyprian is not, as Pastor Mike says, an evidence against Roman primacy. He's actually very strong evidence for it. This is not some obscure thing. This is totally essential. These 
early fathers do not agree with the Roman Catholic Church. There isn't like this unanimous voice saying Roman Catholic theology. This is why Catholicism and Catholic theologians have to edit and cut and paste the things that the church fathers say to create a, you know, a, an appearance that it's teaching. And so what the church does is say, they say, yeah, the church fathers have authoritative tradition, but we select which things they said are authoritative. And then they piece it together to, you know, to endorse their current theology. The fourth issue is this. Right. So we can either believe that an apostolic tradition that Jesus gave the apostles was preserved faithfully throughout all of church history, even though there are exceptions, even though there are people who are not true witnesses to it, but false witnesses to it, but they are the exception, not the norm amongst the writings of the church fathers, or that the apostolic tradition was basically lost right after the, right after the end of the apostolic age, similar to what Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses say, and it wasn't found until, I don't know, the Reformation or the middle of the 20th century, depending on where you say its fullness is, I'm going to go with that the apostolic tradition was was preserved. Everyone's going to talk about where it lies. You either have bona fide historical pedigrees going back to the apostles, or you have your interpretation of the Bible that apparently people did not figure out for 1,500 years or even 1,900 years until after the time of Christ. That's three. Here's the fourth. It completely and utterly ignores the Bible. Quoting early church fathers is a problem because it ignores the Bible. Now, does the Bible say anything about how the church is to be run? Yeah, it talks about the offices of the church in 1 Timothy 3, in Titus 1, in 1 Corinthians 12, and the continuing offices of the church are elders and deacons, and a pope is never mentioned. Not once. Not even once. The bishops and the apostles are mentioned, and the pope is a bishop. He is an apostle, and he, have, uh, he has specific primacy and jurisdictional leadership over the others, which we see demonstrated in Peter's role in the early church, as I talked about in my, in my previous episodes. Doesn't it seem irresponsible of God to leave us with the scriptures and not mention that he has one person who's ruling over the whole church and he's just silent about that guy? There's no pope, there's no magisterium, there are teachers. Why didn't the Bible, why doesn't the Bible tell us, oh, and by the way, uh, the authority for any believer in Christ is going to be these 66 books of the Protestant Bible and these 27 books of the New Testament especially. Isn't it irresponsible that God did not leave us an inspired list of writing to say, by the way, if you need your authority, these are the books you go to. Isn't that irresponsible? God didn't leave us that? Well, he didn't because God didn't leave us sola scriptura. He left us a church which preserves his word, written and unwritten, given to us today. But they're not considered infallible. They're not considered infallible. It's up to the individual Christians to test them by the word. That's how the New Testament puts it. But that's He's talking about pastors here. You know, so I, I want to go back. This is an important, let's see, this is an important point here to see what he's saying about it. Well, it's up to the individual Christians to test them by the word. That's how the New Testament puts it. But that's not Roman Catholic theology. And the church... That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that it is up to Christians to test their pastors to see if their pastors conform to what the Bible says. Because we didn't have a complete Bible at this time and long after the apostolic age as well. Hebrews 13:17 says this. Hebrews 13:17 says, "Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give account." So it doesn't say you test your leaders, say, "Well, this guy follows my interpretation of the Bible, so I'm going to follow him." That's not what the Bible says. In Hebrews 13:17 it says to obey your leaders and to follow them. I would also say that a lot of pastors their authority comes from, well, I read the Bible, I preach, people listen to me, they find guidance in me, they feel like the Holy Spirit's working through me, so I'm going to start a church, and, and people attend, and they they like what I what I have to say, they like how I expound upon the Word. That's how a lot of people are pastors, or they'll go to seminary and then become pastors, but many pastors don't go to seminary. Where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say that you can become a pastor because the Holy Spirit moved you? It doesn't say that. The Bible only talks about people becoming pastors when hands are laid upon them by others who already are pastors and have connections to the apostles themselves. That was the key in the Bible, and especially the key in the early church. When you're trying to find the Church of Christ, you go to Ignatius, you go to Augustine. Within those hundreds of years, the answer is always the same. Go to the bishops who have connections to the apostles, who have an actual list going back to them. The church is not an organization. The church is the people. I love the phrase, the church is an organism not an organization. When you get saved, even if you're alone on a boat out in the, middle, in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle and you give your life to Jesus Christ, you're part of the church, even though you have not joined any affiliation of any particular local group of believers. You are part of the church. But in Catholicism, 
You can put faith in Jesus and not be part of the church because you have not joined the church, the Catholic church. And so this is, this is the organization of the church in the scripture is pretty clear, and it disagrees with, uh, with, with um, Roman Catholic theology. The, the Bible is very clear that what makes you a member of Christ's church is baptism. Remember Acts chapter 2, uh, it says that 3,000 people were baptized and they were added to the church's numbers that day. Acts chapter 8 with the, the Ethiopian eunuch, that ultimately his incorporation of the church ended with when he was, it began, the seed was planted with his conversation with the evangelist Philip, but then it didn't, he wasn't initiated into the church until he was baptized. Baptism is what washes away sin, it makes us adopted sons and daughters of God, and makes us members of Christ's church. And baptism in the Catholic Church makes you fully a member of Christ's church. What the Second Vatican Council taught is that Christ's church, the Church of Christ, subsists in the Catholic Church. What that means is it's not identical, it's not identical to it, because we recognize there are elements of Christ's church beyond the visible confines of the Catholic Church. But just as there is apostolic authority and a hierarchy in the early Church, the Church in its fullest form, historically endures through this same kind of hierarchy, so the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic faith, in the Catholic Church, but we recognize that people like Pastor Mike, other Protestant Christians, they are, they have an imperfect communion with Christ's Church. Even someone who is a catechumen that Pastor Mike's describing, who has faith in Jesus. I was that for 10 months before I was baptized at the age of 17, that you can have faith in Jesus, desire salvation, and you wait for baptism, and in the early church, if a cat, in the same today, if a catechumen died, they were buried in a Christian cemetery and given a, a Christian funeral because they had a baptism of desire that God honored. That's something that's always been recognized in the church's history. They had an imperfect relationship with Christ's church, in imperfect communion. They long for perfect communion. That's what we desire for our, our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, that perfect communion in the one church Christ established. Now, Galatians 1, we talked about last week. And Galatians 1 has this beautiful passage where Paul threatens himself <laughs> and anyone else who is to preach a false gospel, or even, actually, he just says a different gospel. He just, just I mean, a different gospel equals a false gospel, right? So he just says, if anyone, me, whether it's me, whether it's anyone else, an angel from heaven even, even with supernatural powers, comes and preaches to you a gospel other than what you've already received, let him be anathema. So that means that the, the hearer, the Galatian person who read this, and me and you, to whom God wrote it as well, we're supposed to hear what, hear what comes from other people, leaders and teachers, and say, let me compare that to what I've already received. That's not, that's not accurate. Then I reject you. So we're individually responsible. Pretty sneaky, Pastor Mike. Remember that old Connect Four commercial? Pretty sneaky, sis. We're supposed to compare it. And how does he compare it? I pick up my Bible and read it. Well, why wouldn't the people in, in Paul's time, and even for long after that, that's not what they would have... They wouldn't have gone to his physical letter from the Galatians. They would have said... That's not what you told us last time. That's not what we heard from you last time. So yeah, you should not contradict the gospel. But And as we showed in my previous video with Pastor Mike on Sol where I dealt with Sola Scriptura, Galatians 1 doesn't prove Sola Scriptura. It just proves don't deform the gospel. Don't trade the gospel, the divine revelation that has been given to you, with another alleged divine revelation. But that doesn't mean that divine revelation is restricted to the written word of God in Scripture. It's given to us in the written word in Scripture and in the unwritten word in sacred tradition. And during the time of the first Christians, it was found in the living authority of the apostles, and their authority continued in their successors. And for the letter of Clement, written in the first century, says specifically Clement had attachments to, to Peter. He was the fourth pope. Uh, here's a great witness to what the apostles said. And he says in 1 Clement 44 that the apostles knew there would be strife for the office of bishop. So they anointed successors to, have, to carry on their authority. So this is, this is not a, a proof text of Sola, Sola Scriptura, not in any way, shape, or form. ...responsible for accepting and rejecting teaching based upon how it lines up with the Word. And this is, this is beautiful. Paul had delivered the Gospel, and even Paul the Apostle, with all his authority, says, not even I am allowed to change what you've already received. So how could the Catholic Church then develop doctrine and then say they're the only ones who can interpret it? It's, it's not biblical. In the same way that <clears throat> Pastor Mike reflecting on 2,000 years of Christian history, can use terms like trinity, uh, penal substitution, uh, when he, about his theory of the atonement, uh, understanding hypostatic union, that, of course, doctrine is going to develop, but it doesn't radically change. It's not, doctrine is not going to become some kind of a false gospel that contradicts what, what was already received. So, and the Catholic teaching does not contradict what is in Scripture, and if Pastor Mike or other, other pastors or apologists say that, 
then I'll have to engage them in another video or maybe we could have a debate on the issue. This is an issue because there are times when spiritual leaders get wrong. In the Old Testament, there were bad spiritual leaders. Aaron, who helped them build a golden calf and then told Moses when he came back down the mountain, and then this thing just popped out of the fire. You're like, it's like, it's like it wasn't a very good liar, that guy. Aaron's sons were burned up. God fired them because they, uh, they, they were offering strange fire before the Lord. In Gideon, Gideon, who's, I love Gideon, awesome guy, beautiful truths in the story of Gideon in the book of Judges. But Gideon, in his later life, did stuff that just makes us not even want to talk about that part. You know what I mean? Not because we're ashamed of what the Bible says, because the Bible condemns what he did. It, it's, it's just sad to see how a great leader could go south. Several of the rightful kings of Israel, right, let me point this out, rightful authorities in Israel taught bad, wrong things. And God calls the people to go to his word rather than to trust them. In the New Testament, this is consistent. No, what he says is, follow the revelation they gave you, but don't act like them. Don't be hypocrites. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, do what the rabbis tell you, but they teach, but don't imitate them because they don't live what they teach. Same with the apostles. Peter was a coward. Uh, <laughs> Peter was a hypocrite. Paul had to stand up to him in Galatians chapter 2. And you go through church history, there have been some pretty bad popes. There have been some pretty bad Protestant pastors. There's a lot of bad leaders. The question is, what is their ultimate authority? Where do they get their authority from? Where is Revelation found? That's the issue we have to confront. Jesus encounters the Pharisees. In fact, the, the Pharisees are so much like Catholic leadership. And I'm not saying the Catholic leaders are Pharisees. I'm saying there are some parallels here. The Pharisees claimed authority from Moses. The Catholic Church claims authority from Jesus. The Pharisees said, we're in Moses' seat. We have Moses' position to tell you what his word means and what God's word means and all this. And we're the leaders and you do what we say. The Catholic Church says, we sit in Jesus' spot, the chair of Peter, and we declare to you all, with all authority. The Pharisees claimed to have traditions that were authoritative and that everyone must observe or they would be rejecting God. The Roman Catholic Church claims to have traditions that are authoritative and everyone must observe or they're rejecting God. The Pharisees had some biblical teachings and they had some unbiblical teachings. The Roman Catholic Church has some biblical teachings and some unbiblical teachings. Um, the consistencies are, are consistent <laughs> between the two of them. Jesus, so how did Jesus treat the Pharisees? Um, well, if you've read the New Testament, which I think everybody here has, you know how Jesus dealt with the Pharisees. Not to say he hated them. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Jesus dealt harshly with him, but to open his eyes, to pop those eyes open, and Nicodemus came to the Lord beautifully, wonderfully, right? But in Matthew 16, he tells the people, Matthew 16, he tells the people, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And then it goes on to, to, to interpret this for us. I love when they get to, the Bible interprets it for us to say this meant the teaching or the doctrine of the Pharisees. Beware the doctrine of the Pharisees. So yeah, he said to you know, let them have some authority because they're in this spot or whatever, but beware their doctrine. Don't follow the things that are not accurate. Go, go to the word, go to the word, go to the word. Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I've heard this before. Catholics are, are Pharisees because they have all these rules. Uh, Protestants, though, especially evangelicals, have a lot of rules too as well. They're not as permissive as some liberal mainline denominations. Uh, you can leave the comments below. I'm sure I'm getting this wrong. Well, I mean, I can't get the full title. There was a while back a guy wrote something called the Cotton Gospel. So I, I think it's called the Cotton Gospel. It, the, the New Testament Gospels, the stories are retold in uh, like modern day Georgia, or I mean, not modern day, but like uh, 19th or early 20th century Georgia. So Jerusalem is Atlanta. Galilee is a small town in Georgia. The Protestants of the time are Sadducees, and the Catholics of the time are the Pharisees. So it's, it's a well-worn charge. But I would say, no, I think actually Protestants are more like Pharisees. And here's why. So the Pharisees prided themselves on mastering the Torah. They knew the Hebrew Bible inside and out and what it meant. And they took it upon themselves to study it. And some of them became very winsome teachers who would teach others to understand God's written word. Well, Protestant pastors do that. They study the Bible. They become winsome teachers. And they tell other people how they, other, how they understand it. Let's see, where did I put down the other here? Oh, oh, and the other thing is tradition. So yeah, the, the Pharisees had their own traditions that they imposed upon people based upon their understanding of the Hebrew Bible, primarily, their, their understanding of it, uh, in the same way that Protestants have their own traditions that they have imposed upon the Bible, sola scriptura, sola fide, salvation can't be lost, once saved, always saved. You should say the sinner's prayer to be saved. That's not found in the Bible. And the Pharisees 
the problem that the apostles dealt with was they were trying to give them, here's God's revelation, it's given to us that we are the teaching office, that God became man and left us the authority to teach, and the Pharisees said, no, 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 this is what it says in the Hebrew Bible, it says circumcision is an enduring covenant, it says we offer these sacrifices, no, 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 it says here in the Word, I'm going to the Word, I'm going to the Word, Apostle Paul, I'm going to the Word, Peter, and the Word in the Hebrew Bible says this, so I'm rejecting you, I reject you, because this is what the Word says. Does that sound familiar? So I would say that actually Protestants, the way that they engage with the Catholic faith and their understanding of, of the Bible and their authority drawn from Sola Scriptura, it's very similar to the Pharisees and how they engage, especially with, with Jesus and with the apostles and debating with them and trying to stick only to the Old Testament and rejecting the authority of Christ's church. So I think the parallel is actually for for Protestantism to be more like Pharisees. But you know what? At the end of the day, I, I don't want to do this kind of name-calling stuff. You're a Pharisee. You're a Pharisee. Uh, you know, I I don't want to do that. I mean, Pastor Mike is, you know, he's a Christian. He's a brother in the Lord. I get that he sees that Catholicism as he believes it's wrong, so he wants to correct it. I do the same thing with Protestantism. So, and I appreciate that he's not fully coming out and being like, Catholics are a bunch of Pharisees. Uh, Pastor Mike's actually doing this in a pretty genteel way that I that I appreciate. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, of course, still truth is truth matters. And we got to see who has the correct understanding of divine revelation and and who doesn't. So but that's just my I felt like I need to make that reply when people say Catholics are just a bunch of Pharisees. I think the charge actually more accurately applies to Protestants, but hey, let's just let's figure out who's understanding divine revelation correctly. That's what that's what we should do. Jesus systematically dismantled the bad doctrines of the Pharisees. He targeted them. He like specifically pointed out the bad doctrines in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He talks about mar marriage and he restores a biblical view of marriage. He talks about rituals and about how there were vain rituals and prayers, vain prayers. Don't use vain repetition when you pray, he says. And he talked about um, the fact that they put too much emphasis on appearance and upon, upon their, their phylacteries, they make them big and broad, and da, 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 and it's, it's, the emphasis is in the wrong place. But he actually targeted the places where they got it wrong, and when he spoke to the Pharisees, he would often say to them things like this. And notice, these guys, these guys were like pros in the Word, right? They just study the Word and traditions and everything. He says, haven't you read? <laughs> Which seems to me to be insulting. Like, if you came to me and were like, Mike, haven't you even read in Exodus where it says that, I'd be like, well, gosh, like, but you're really saying I'm clueless when you say that. And Jesus was saying that. John, in the first introduction of the Pharisees to the entire Bible scene in Matthew 3, John, as they're coming up, here come the Pharisees, and John opens his mouth, and he calls them a brood of vipers. So what am I saying? The Bible makes it clear that we need to go to the Bible, not to the leaders. The lesson of the Pharisees were that they were hypocrites, okay? They were people who misinterpreted God's revelation, who misinterpreted it based on their human traditions. They would read scripture, and they would read about the law of vows, and make it seem like the Bible was teaching that if you gave money to the temple, you don't have to support your aging parents, based on the law of vows that they found in the book of Numbers, completely ignoring what God wrote in the book of Exodus about honoring thy father and thy mother. So the Pharisees drew out, and they put these heavy burdens on people, uh, based on their misinterpretation and misunderstanding based on human traditions. And also because they, they did teach some things were right, but then they would just live in a completely different way and would send people to hell based on how they lived because they wouldn't follow their own teaching. That's the lesson from the Pharisees, not just follow, do what the Bible says, sola scriptura. Because many of them followed the, the Hebrew Bible. And of course, they'll say, well, they were also following the tradition of the rabbis before them. Right, just like Pastor Mike and other Protestants interpret the Bible based on interpretations, previous Protestant pastors from the early 20th, 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th centuries gave before them. That when you read the Reformers, the debate between the Reformers and the Counter-Reformers in the, the 16th century, you go forward to George Salmon and his arguments against papal infallibility, it's all the same. A lot of it just gets recycled over and over again. So a lot of Protestants, come on, you are inheriting, you, you quote other, you know, if you, especially if you're, if you're versed in theology, at least, you're going to be drawing, if you have a fleshed out theology, you're going to draw from other theologians that have gone before you, and you'll cite them as, as authorities, just like the Pharisees cited other rabbis and their authority. The question is, who has the actual proper authority to tell us what divine revelation is, what constitutes it, and, and what it means? And I would say only the Church Christ established has that authority to do that. Very clear. 
Example after example after example. In fact, we know for sure that there were false teachers in the day when the scriptures were written, whole books of the New Testament were written specifically to combat false teachers. We know that in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, let me read it to you. For I know this, Paul speaking, after my departure, I like how he calls his, his death, depart, his departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from these are two different groups, savage wolves come into the flock, but from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples, and notice to what end, after themselves. So there's going to be people who come into the church or come from in the church and they stand up and they start making it about them instead of about the Lord. They start making it about their kingdom and they're getting people to come and follow me, follow me, follow me instead of follow Jesus. Or like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, but don't just follow me. So there was a, a warning that there would become a time where people made it about them instead of about following Jesus. That they tried to build their kingdom and their sort of like cluster of follow me people. And that's entirely what the Catholic Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has done. Well, there's more reasons, but the point... Well, these are people who are trying to create their own authority apart from apostolic authority. And so Paul is right. He's saying that he is not the focal point. Christ is. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. But he's also concerned about people who are trying to usurp the rightful authority Paul had as an apostle, or Peter had as an apostle, especially those who were trying to usurp that authority and preach heresies like the Judaizing heresy of that time to say that to be a good Christian, you got to be a good Jew first and be circumcised. So it does not follow from this that there is no authority in the church just because there were false authorities in the church. It took the true authorities to root out the false ones. And here is the only way to sort out biblical belief from unbiblical belief is to actually go to the Bible, not to the early church fathers, not to the later church fathers, not to any of these guys, because I knew there were false teachers in the time of the apostles. So how could I just go to old writings? I know that afterwards, people would come from within the church with false teachings. I'm warned in Acts about it. So how can I go to the writings of some of those people, knowing that there would be false teaching coming from amongst them? So I have to patiently, faithfully go to the scriptures. Well, I, I don't understand this. I get it makes sense if you're saying the only way to separate that which is biblical from unbiblical is to go to the Bible. Like, the writings of the church fathers are unbiblical. Uh, well, they're non-biblical. So I guess it's biblical, unbiblical. Unbiblical means you contradict the Bible. Non-biblical would just means you are not of the Bible. So the writings of the Church Fathers are non-biblical. Pastor Mike's YouTube videos are non-biblical. This channel is non-biblical. It just means it's not the Bible. Sure, okay. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everything that is non-biblical is automatically unbiblical. In order to do that, you can't just go to the Bible, because you, then you're relying on your interpretation about what the Bible says. You know, I just had a chat with Mike Lacona recently, uh, the evangelical apologist, great guy on the resurrection, by the way, and we did an interview about his book on alleged contradictions in the Bible, and that'll be in Council of Trent probably in a uh, few weeks, or the end of March. And Mike Lacona said this, he said, uh, he, he quoted Bruce Metzger, who said, the Bible doesn't mean what it says, it means what it means. So it just mean what, it means what it says. Well, it's like when you go see your wife at home. Honey, what's wrong? Is everything okay? Or, honey, is anything wrong? No. Well, it's not means what it says, it means what it means. We know that can have a whole shade of meaning involved in it. So to see what is not... So the binary should not be biblical, non-biblical. It should be... Is it the revelation of God or not God's revelation? So we should see who is the revelation been, been entrusted to. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test all things, hold fast to that which is good. How can I test all things if the Roman church's claim to have all authority is true? I can't. I don't get to test anything. They test it all, and I just hold fast whatever they say. That's scary to me. Acts 17.11 because there are things the church has not defined, for example, such as whether a certain kind of spiritual leader or someone who is being a teacher, whether that person is producing good fruit or bad fruit, you might have to test that according to what the church teaches, what the Bible teaches, for example, something that has not been defined. You'll have to do testing yourself, though primarily in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the testing there is referring to particular kinds of spiritual goods, certain kind of prophesying and speaking in tongues and, and things like that, so... Acts 17.11 says this, and this applies to us. When the apostles went to Berea and they preached the gospel there, here's how the Bereans responded. Now, I want you to, to think, based on Catholic authority, 
how would a, a good Roman Catholic view what the Bereans did? These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were true. Now, Roman Catholic doctrine would imply that this is a bad exercise. You're, we're the ones that can interpret the Bible. You can't. Now, many Roman Catholics would be like, this is a good idea. I mean, they would, the individuals would be like, yeah, search the scriptures, find out. But the implication here is that you have enough discernment to go to the Bible yourself and read it for yourself and figure out whether these doctrines are accurate or not. But the Roman Catholic claim is you don't. This is why the church over the centuries held back the Bible from getting to people. Now, the, the current pope did tell people, okay, well, okay. read your Bibles. And good for him. Good. That's good. Why did it take so long? Oh, they. Okay. Um, a lot here to unpack. First, we have the argument from the noble Bereans. So this is a, another... There's not a lot of verses in the Bible that are used to support sola scriptura, because it's not biblical. The biggest one is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Some, some Protestant apologists only use that verse for their what is a cornerstone of their theology. A, a lot of others will cite Acts 17, 11, uh, and here's what it says. Uh, now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The reason the Jews in Thessalonica uh, or sorry, the reason the Jews in Berea, the Bereans, were so noble was because they weren't jerks, in the sense they didn't start a riot. So you go before Acts 7, start at the beginning of Acts 17, Paul and Silas, I think it's Paul and Silas, there's a Barnabas, Paul and an associate, go to Berea, and then they convert, they preach in the synagogue, and they convert some Jews and Gentiles, but some of the Jews won't have it, they're unconvinced. And so they create a riot, and they drive Paul out of town. They do the same thing in Thessalonica, that Paul went there, he converted some Jews and Gentiles, and but there wasn't a riot. They gave him, the Jews there gave him a fair hearing. So they went back, and they were willing to listen to him, and they looked at the Old Testament prophecies to see if what Paul said was vindicated, to, to check him out. But if, this is not an argument for sola scriptura, because you don't have an example here of Paul preaching to Christians, and then Christians saying, whoa, 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 Paul, hold on, let's look at all these other letters and see if you're, you're right. They listened to him based on his apostolic authority. Second, I always am amazed by Protestant apologists who cite this example with the noble Bereans, with the Bereans in Acts 17, because what they're concerned about are people who will believe something and not check to see if it's in the Bible, that they're, they're credulous. So, to con so in order to show why the Bereans were noble, we have to contrast them the to the Jews in Thessalonica. And so this would be a much better case for Sola Scriptura if the Jews in Thessalonica just believed whatever Paul told them and never bothered to check the Old Testament. That's not what happened, though. I bet you some of them did check the Old Testament and said, hey, Paul, the Old Testament never says that the Messiah will be crucified and die and will rise from the dead three days later. It doesn't say that here in the Old Testament. Only maybe implicitly with your little argument from prophecy, but it doesn't explicitly say it, so I, I reject you. The ones who rejected Paul based on search, they searched the scriptures and applied a rigid sola scriptura to St. Paul. That's why the, the Jews didn't, that's why they didn't convert. So the, the, the Jews in Thessalonica, they gave Paul a fair hearing. They were willing to hear him out and see what he had to say. They didn't start a riot. This has nothing to do with sola scriptura. And in fact, Paul's dealings with the Thessal Thessalonians contradicts sola scriptura, because he told them in his first letter to them, he said, when you received the word of God which you heard from us, uh, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which shows the word of God exists in a written and an unwritten form. Let's go back. And... <laughs> Why is it? I mean, that, that the Catholic Church... Um over the years, and even in the time of the Reformation, was persecuting people for translating the Bible into the, the native language of the people around them. They only wanted it in Latin. They didn't want the Bible to be read by the people individually, not in a language they understood. Um, they bought, bought Bibles that were printed. They burned them, destroyed them so people couldn't get them. And, um, and even still, in many places, the, the services happen in languages people can understand. There is not an emphasis on educating the people of God with the Word of God. All right, let's jump into this one here. Uh, first, it's not true. Some people will say that, like, William Tyndale produced the verse vernacular translation of the Bible, and that's not the case. There have been vernacular translations of the Bible long before uh, the Protestant Reformation. In 1466, you had the German Mentalin Bible, and then hundreds of years before that, Guillaume de Moulin 
had his French translation of the Bible that was published in 1297 with the approval of the church. There's nothing wrong with that. You go back even further in the Eastern Church, you had a vernacular translation of the Bible because in the Eastern Empire, people spoke Syriac, for example. And so you had the Peshitta, which was the Syriac Bible that was used in the Eastern Church. And in the West, you had the Vulgate, you had Jerome's Vulgate. It was in Latin, but people spoke Latin. Latin was the language of the Western Empire. So it was the reason it was in Latin is because that was the language that they spoke. Now, it's true that some of the Bibles were locked up, and that's because they're made of these beautiful illuminated manuscripts. They were locked up for the same reason you lock your car at night, because they're valuable. You don't want them to be stolen. But they were preached to people at the masses that they would go to, and people would hear them, and people knew the word. I mean, St. Augustine, people knew the word. Augustine recorded, St. Augustine recorded that St. Jerome's translation of the book of Jonah that he translated something about how Jonah fell asleep under an ivy or a gourd, and he used a different translation. And Augustine said the people were so aghast at Jerome's tran- mistranslation that they started to riot in the street. Your very first cancel culture, ladies and gentlemen. So people had, of course, they had a love for the word. But the wor- but, and, and some Bibles were destroyed because they were heretical Bibles produced during the Reformation that had anti-Catholic bias. And Pastor Winger would agree that people should not read Bibles that are bad translations, like the Message Bible, which isn't even a translation, it's a paraphrase. But there are translations of the Bible that are that are horrendous. I mean, I'm sure Pastor Mike would say, I'm sure if Pastor Mike could, he would love to burn every copy of the New World translation of the Bible, which is the Jehovah's Witness translation. Why? Because it's a faulty translation that denies the divinity of Christ. So if Pastor Mike would be okay saying, hey, stay away from these bad translations, that's something the Church did as well, because the Church has the authority to be the protector and custodian of God's sacred word. And letting them get the Bible into their own laps and test all things. So this is, that's not a biblical view, that's all I'm saying. Now, there, there is a change going on in the Roman Catholic Church, encouraging people to read the, read the word. That's a good change, I would encourage that. Yeah, read the Bible, read the Bible. Test what I say too, don't just take my, my word for it. So... The Bible, in effect, here's my conclusion. The Bible teaches the opposite of tradition. It teaches the opposite. There are occasional traditions. Tradition is just from the Latin word tradere. It means that which is handed on. Greek, it's paradosis. I, you know, Paul says, I have received what I deliver up to you, my paradosis, a tradition. It's that which is handed on. The Bible isn't contradictory to tradition. The Bible is tradition. The Bible is, you can argue the Bible is a part of sacred tradition. Because the Word of God in the written and unwritten form have been handed on to us. That is all that tradition is. Now, it's hard sometimes to discern what tradition is. They'll say, well, how do you know which traditions which are not? How do you know which writings are biblical or not? Based on a tradition. You know what belongs in the canon and what doesn't. So tradition is that which is handed on. The revelation of God has been handed on to us through a, a chain of custody through the successors of the apostles in Christ's church. You'll see uh, Jesus observe. He, he goes to, the, to Hanukkah, that festival that was not in the Old Testament, but they do it. So we have a case for Jesus celebrating a holiday that was not specifically outlined in the Old Testament. I'm like, great, because I happen to like Christmas. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that that Hanukkah event was somehow authoritative and that everyone, you know, it, it, just, it just doesn't go to the next. Oh, by the way, there are Christians who don't celebrate Christmas because it's not in the Bible. And they say they're the more faithful adherents to Sola Scriptura. So something to think about stage. However, many, many, many times we have tradition being being told, uh, being spoken against. The traditions of man being taught as the oracles of God, yada, yada. It's not tradition that is condemned. And Mark, many, many times, he's talking about Mark chapter 7, basically. Uh, so Mark 7, and it's parallel in Matthew. Tradition is condemned when it's called traditions of men, or your traditions, not tradition simpliciter. Because tradition is just that which is handed on. And if God handed it on, it's okay. So the Bible teaches, in a sense, the opposite of the Roman Catholic view on tradition. So what is the real history? I want to do now, uh, move away from that, that that one pillar of the church, I think we've taken a big chunk out of it, and the rest of it's going to fall, I think, right now, as we overview what uh, what's the real story. How did the Roman Catholic Church develop? So the Roman Catholic version, that they've always basically believed the same things they do today, that the Roman Catholic Church is basically a slightly different version of what it was in Peter's day, is completely um, untrue, historically. The book of Acts records for us the birth of the New Testament church and some of the history of the first 30 years of Christianity. In spite of great persecution, by the end of the first century AD, churches have been established in lots of different cities throughout the Roman Empire, 
including Rome. Primarily because of its location at the capital of Rome, the church in Rome very slowly over time began to get more, more authority, more prominence in, from other churches. But it happened if, it gradually over time. It did not have it initially. In fact, the chief church in the very early church was located where? Anybody want to guess? In Jerusalem. That's why the council in Acts 15 happened in Jerusalem, not Rome. Um, not just because it was convenient, but because that's where the apostles were and that's where sort of the center of Christianity was. When persecution increased, it seemed to move over to Antioch as far as is there a church that others are looking to, you know? And, um, and oh, by the way, tradition says that St. Peter served for a time as a bishop in Antioch. And he was important. He was the bishop of that see before he ended his life in the city of Rome, which we'll get to in a little bit. Then over time, it eventually started to started to be Rome, but there were other competitors as well. In 313, the year 313, now we're way after Jesus already at this point, and we're generations and generations away. The Roman Emperor Constantine, he brought them from persecution to legalization. He legalized the Christian faith. He ended the persecution of Christians with what's called the Edict, Edict of Milan in 313. Um, and the there were also some edicts a few years earlier in the Eastern Empire. Constantine wasn't the first. There were, I think it was under Galerius, a few years earlier in the Eastern Empire, but yeah, around this time. Christian persecution was on and again, off again. It was not a continuous persecution from uh, the Apostolic Times to 313. There were times under Diocletian or Decian where they were heavier, other times where they were lighter or no persecution. So it would depend who you got in office, basically, for emperor. The church began gaining greater prominence because now they could practice their Christianity more publicly. Now they could just be more open about it. So they started to get more and more prominence. Most scholars outside the Catholic Church they reject the popular teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that the church at Rome was established by Christ himself through Peter. And there, I'm going to give you five reasons why. Number one, there is no record, none, that Peter was ever the bishop of Rome, as the Catholic Church claims. None. There's just no record of it. When we talk about uh, Rome being founded by Peter and Peter's primacy over the bishop of Rome and the city of Rome, it does not relate to the fact that, oh, Peter was the first person to ever get to Rome and preach to people. That's not what the primacy is based on. Uh, if you go to the Catholic Encyclopedia, for example, this is what it says. It says it is an indisputably established historical fact that St. Peter labored in Rome uh, during the last portion of his life and there ended his earthly course by martyrdom. As to the duration of his apost uh, apostolic uh, activity in the Roman capital, the continuity or otherwise of his residence there, the details and success of his labors, and the chronology of his arrival and death, so everything else he did before his death there, all these questions are uncertain and can be solved only on hypotheses more or less well-founded. The essential fact is that Peter died at Rome. This constitutes the historical foundation of the claim of the bishops of Rome to the apostolic primacy of Peter. So uh, the primacy of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, is not founded in the Bishop of Rome being St. Peter who founded the church in Rome. It's the fact that Peter was bishop of, was the Bishop of Rome at some time, uh, that he died there, and that his successors in Rome continue to take up his mantle, his leadership, and his authority. So a lot of Pastor Mike's arguments going forward are rendered moot because the Catholic claim is not based on Peter or Paul or someone founding the church there, though there is some indirect evidence Peter was involved in the founding of the church at Rome, and that he certainly, he definitely was at Rome. He definitely died there. That's a historical fact, regardless of what Pastor Mike and others may say, and we'll, we'll get to that here uh, shortly. Not only does the Bible not teach Peter was the Pope, he wasn't even a leader in Rome. But that's central to the Catholic claim. They have to say Rome, the city of Rome, is where authorities carried because over the centuries other people would, would claim it as well. So they go, no, no, only Rome, only Rome. Why? Um, because Peter, because Peter came here, and so then it's like Peter came here, and therefore it's stuck. The authority stuck here. Irenaeus is the earliest source saying that Peter was the, was the founder of the church in Rome, and he's from 200 A.D. The earliest source, 200 A.D. He said that Peter and Paul founded the church in Rome. The irony here is, we know Paul did not found the church in Rome. So we know half of what Irenaeus says is wrong. Because read the Bible. Romans, the book, shows us that the church was well established and Paul had not been there yet. And he's like, oh, I want to come and visit you and I'd like to come see you and I want to impart some spiritual gift to you, you know. And he wants to get over there, but he had not yet visited them. And so Irenaeus, I'm going to say, hey, I know Paul didn't, so why should I think Peter did? You're, you're half wrong for sure. And you're 200 years uh, later, so, you know. Uh, let's talk then about this claim. First, we have earlier historical evidence than Irenaeus for Peter being in Rome. Read St. Ignatius of Antioch in his letter to the Romans. This is an amazing letter talking about the primacy of the church at Rome. It's a really amazing letter written in 110 AD. So here we have just 
a few decades from the death of the last apostles. I mean, this is so close. And in the letter to the Romans, Ignatius of Antioch, remember Antioch is an important see at this time, Ignatius says this, I do not, as Peter and Paul did, issue commandments unto you. And of the church at Rome, you never envied anyone. You have taught others. He says the church at Rome presides in love. And that, that word presides, he uses in his letter to the Magnesians as talking about the bishopric and presiding in uh, having a juridical or a leader capacity within the church. When you read the other letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, the, the Smyrnians, the Tralians, the Magnesians, these, these different letters, you point them on a map, they're all little communities in Asia Minor, which are probably under Ignatius's authority. And he corrects people, he rebukes people, he tells them, hey, get your act together. But then Ignatius sends a letter to Rome where he's going to be taken because he's now been arrested. He's going to be martyred in Rome. And he sends letters. And we know from historical research at this time that a person in Roman custody could send letters. That's, that doesn't mean these are forgeries or anything like that. He sent a letter during his captivity, just like Paul sent letters in his captivity. And he, his, what is his letter to Rome, a very far away church from him, for, for this church he's ever written to? What does he tell them? He never corrects them. He never rebukes them. He only has one request— do not try to rescue me from my martyrdom. But he heaps voluminous praise on the Roman church people listen to, that it has an authority very different from any other church at that time. And so, uh, and of course, he, he attests to the existence of, um, of Peter being there, that Peter and Paul were there and that they commanded people there. So what about Irenaeus, though? So Irenaeus in Against Heresies, I think this is 3.3.3, it's easy to remember this important part of Against Heresies, St. Irenaeus's five-volume work, uh, very important work in early church history. Uh, in section 3.3.3, he talks about the apostol apostolic foundation of the faith, specifically the successors of St. Peter, uh, Roman primacy. And he says, that tradition derived from the apostles of the very great, the very ancient, and universally founded church, universally known church, founded and organized at Rome, by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. Okay, Now, uh, we do know that Paul was in Rome for a time, and he commanded people there. The very last verses of the book of Acts say in Acts 28, verses 30 through 31, Paul lived in Rome two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ quite openly and unhindered. So what Irenaeus here means by Peter and Paul founding the church at Rome, it's not like they were the first people to get there, but their stamp of approval as apostles, as the prince of the apostles, and Paul, the apostle uh, to, you know, who wrote most of the New Testament, that they taught there in a special way and lent their stamp of approval to the Roman church and were crucial in founding it and building it up as an important see or church uh, within the early Christian community. That's what Irenaeus means here, and it's the same and that is the same kind of uh, language that's used in later church historians in the early church that we'll get to here when Pastor Mike talks about uh, Eusebius. Eusebius. Now, this guy, Eusebius, I'm going to give you, these are, the four, these are the five reasons. Number two is this. Eusebius, who's called the father of church history, he was a historian, he lived between 260 and 341. He never mentions Peter as the bishop of Rome. Now, check this out. He's a believer who writes about the history of the church, and he never mentions Peter as the bishop of Rome. Imagine a Catholic today writing a survey of Catholic history and never mentioning Peter, the first pope. You can't, it, it, you know, it's like not mentioning George Washington and writing a survey of American history. Why doesn't he do it? Because the later claims about Peter hadn't happened yet, so it wasn't important to them to do that, and he wasn't part of the, what is now the Roman Catholic Church, that's not what Eusebius was really part of. How could he ignore the first pope? He does say this, here's all he says, at about the end of his days, Peter went to Rome and was crucified there. That's it. Somebody else started the church there. Missionaries, I don't know, individuals. Some lady that heard the gospel in Jerusalem went back to Rome and just started telling people about it. We don't know. It just happened organically because the church is an organism. <laughs> we, how do we grow? I don't know. Just like the same way a baby in the womb grows. Just like, just really in cool ways. <laughs> it just does. Number th uh, Let's actually see what Eusebius had to say about this. So what Eusebius says, first, he talks about Peter's, he doesn't just say, oh, and by the way, Peter died in Rome. And that's it. He has a lot to say. He talks about who Peter's successors were to the episcopate in Rome. He says, after the martyrdom of Paul and of Peter, Linus was the first to obtain the episcopate of the church at Rome. Paul mentions him when writing to Timothy from Rome in the salutation at the end of the epistle. So Eusebius attests to uh, all of Peter's successors 
who held the office that he held in Rome. He talks about th- that that authority, the successors of the episcopate, after the death of the apostles, he lines them all up. It starts with Peter, and then he gives a list of all the successors. Eusebius, uh, he also mentions a letter from Dionysus, who was a bishop of Corinth, writing around the year 170 AD. So he quotes part of the letter, and this is what he says. So this is what Eusebius says about Peter's relationship to Rome, totally different from what Pastor Mike is giving us. Eusebius says that they both uh, suffered martyrdom, Peter and Paul, at the same time as stated by Dionysius, bishop of Corinth, around 170 AD. In his epistle to the Romans, in the following words. So now here Eusebius quotes the original epistle from 170 AD. So this is mid-2nd century testimony. You have thus by such an admonition bound together the planting of Peter and of Paul at Rome and Corinth. For both of them planted and likewise taught us in our Corinth. And they they taught together in like manner in Italy and suffered martyrdom at the same time. I have quoted these things in order that the truth of the history might still more be, be more confirmed. So notice Eusebius here quoting Dionysus is saying is that Paul and Peter, they were involved in founding, planting the church at Rome. They didn't found it like in Corinth, for example, but they did teach together in Italy. They taught together in like manner and were involved in building up the church and founding it in that way. Let's see, what do I have here? Oh, and one more thing. Uh, we have we have good evidence. We also have evidence from Peter himself that he was in Rome. Like this idea, that Peter was not in Rome. Uh, this the scholarship in history is just so far against that thesis. Only, I mean, you can only find it in quoting nineteenth century anti Catholic scholarship. It's not the case. First Peter five thirteen. Saint Peter says, "She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark." So Peter is talking about here being at Babylon. Now, some people have said, oh, well, Peter's the apostle to the Jews. So he was with the Jewish community in Babylon in modern-day Iraq. That's where Peter was at this time. Well, Sean McDowell, who is an evangelical scholar, he wrote a great book. I think it was his doctoral dissertation turned into a book. It's on the fate of the Twelve Apostles, like what happened to the Twelve Apostles, how did they die? Uh, McDowell, Sean McDowell, who's the son of Josh McDowell, the famous evangelical apologist, uh, he wrote Evidence That Demands a Verdict. So Sean McDowell has a great book on the death of the Twelve Apostles, and this is what McDowell says about Peter being in Rome, about being in Babylon or Rome. McDowell says the Old Testament city of Babylon, so in Iraq, was in ruins, so Peter could not have been referring to that city. Rather, it was a relatively common cryptic name for Rome, the enemy of God. So here, Peter refers to himself in a cryptic way in his writings so that he's not outed by the authorities. They'd probably be after him. The authorities operating for Emperor Nero, so he doesn't want to give away his location. So he says Babylon, which is a code name for Rome. Peter's writing from Rome. Because he was, he was in Rome, and he served there as a leader of the church, and then he died there, and his uh, successors followed him. Number three, the third reason why, why we should reject the Roman Catholic view of history here. Uh, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Rome, greets more than two dozen people by name at the end of his letter. See Romans chapter 16. You're like, why is this in here? All these names are just people being greeted. Two dozen people, but who does he leave out? Peter. He greets all kinds of businessmen. He greets different random people, fellow workers, not Peter. That would be a strange omission if Peter was living in Rome, especially if he was the bishop and the first pope of the church to ignore the leader of the church. Supposedly, Peter was the pope. Why doesn't Paul mention him? Okay, uh, what should we conclude from the fact that Paul doesn't mention Peter in his letter to the Romans, um, at the end of the letter to the Romans? Uh, well, there's lots of different things we could conclude, but we should avoid rash hypotheses. Like, oh, well, that means Peter was never in Rome at all. There, So we should conclude that. That sounds to me like seeking evidence for the conclusion Peter was never in Rome, rather than letting the evidence bear that out. So... What are the different things we could conclude from the fact that Peter is not mentioned in Paul's letter to the Romans? He's not addressed, at least. He's not addressed in it explicitly. One, Paul and Peter could have been on the outs. Uh, if this, if Romans was written, we think Romans was written sometime. Paul was probably in Corinth. I think it's probably around 56 AD uh, when the letter was written. Maybe the two had had a falling out ever since uh, Paul confronted Peter in Galatia, and they were just kind of on the outs with each other. So, you know, they just kind of had bad blood between them a little bit because of, because of that uh, episode. So it could have been a personality conflict, why Paul didn't want to mention Peter 
So they were just on the outs. That's one possibility. Uh, and of course, uh, by putting out possibilities, we don't know which one is the correct one. The point is, there are lots of possibilities beyond Peter was just never in Rome at all. Uh, number two might be that Peter wasn't there. He wasn't in the city at that time when Paul was writing. Maybe Paul knew that Peter had returned to Antioch, or he was visiting other churches at that time, or Paul was, uh, or Peter was nearby him, or he knew where he was. So he could, Paul could have known Peter was not in the city at that time and simply didn't, uh, he didn't reference him because of that. Um, so that's, that's another possibility. Uh, could have slipped Paul's mind. You never know. Uh, but just all of these things, we shouldn't rush to the rash conclusion that Peter was never in Rome at all uh, because uh, Paul doesn't address him in the letter. There also is a hypothesis that uh, Paul does mention Peter, and he specifically avoids mentioning Peter by name to avoid uh, the Roman authorities coming after him. Paul doesn't mention any of the other elders or the leaders of the church at Rome either. So that's a surprising omission. And he does say in Romans chapter 15, I think it's Romans 15, 20, 20 or 25, Romans chapter 15, Paul says that he does not want to build on a foundation laid that has been laid by another man. But he doesn't mention who this individual is. And now if you read Richard Bauckham, Bauckham talks about this in the Gospels as well, in some of the earlier Gospels, like Mark's Gospel, there are individuals who are described but not named. And the reason may be that some individuals who are referenced in the Bible, in the New Testament, but are not named is because they want to avoid Roman persecution, so they don't want to out who these people are. So just as Peter does not reveal that he's writing from Rome in his letter, First Peter, he talks about writing from Babylon, Paul may not want to have revealed that he was writing to Peter and that Peter was in Rome for the Roman authorities to intercept this letter or any of the other important leaders in the church at that time. So, and he may have indirectly referred to Peter using this kind of coded language in Romans 15, where he said he didn't want to build, on, build the church on a foundation laid by another man or someone else in other translations. So the point here is just that it's not my burden to prove it's any of these hypotheses. It's the burden on Pastor Mike to say from this omission, he can prove his conclusion Peter was never in Rome at all, which is a gigantic stretch and just can't be sustained by the evidence because it's also contradicted by the other evidence we have clearly linking Peter to the city of Rome, including the fact that he was buried there and we found his tomb there. The fourth reason is that Peter, in First and Second Peter, never calls himself, I've already read to you in First Peter chapter 5, the passage, he never calls himself by any title that puts him above any other church leader. He never calls himself by any title that puts him above any other leader. He's just an apostle. In First Peter 1 and in Second Peter 1, in the introduction to both those letters, he just says, Peter, an apostle. Not like the chief or the leader, none of that kind of stuff, which you might be like, well, he was just being humble. And I'm like, well, there's not really very much humble about calling yourself an apostle. I mean, you're, I'm an apostle. Like, you're not exactly humble here. You're just stating facts. But he just puts himself on even, even uh, playing field with all the other apostles. And last But that's not the case, though, because Peter was given an elevated title above the other apostles. He doesn't refer to himself that way in his epistles. In Galatians 2.9, Paul says that uh, he refers to James, Peter, and John as those who are esteemed as pillars in the church. So uh, James, John, and Peter are called pillars of the church, which is, so they're higher up than the other apostles. They were esteemed as the pillars of the church. So Peter is a pillar of the church by Paul's own uh, teaching. In Galatians 2.9, Peter had the title of pillar of the church, and yet Peter doesn't write in First Peter, I, Peter, a pillar of the church, speak to you, because he's being humble much like he doesn't lord over others the primacy that he had as the leader of the church amongst the other apostles. Because as Jesus said, the leader, the greatest among you, is the one who serves, not one who lords his authority as the Gentiles do. Lastly, much is said about the structure of the church, and it doesn't involve a pope or anything similar to Catholic government. So what we're saying here is this. The papacy is, is not old. I mean, it's older than me and you, but it is not original. There's nothing OG original gospel about, about the papacy. So let's talk more about the history. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, and as the church in Rome allied itself with the Roman government. And we can imagine how this happens. You just begin working more and more closely. They start to consult. They go, hey, will you pray for us? And we're going to do this thing. And you start to get more and more authority. It continues to grow in its authority and influence. Originally, there were multiple bishops and leaders in Rome. As early as the third century, the leaders of the church in Rome were claiming for themselves a supremacy over other churches throughout the empire when it came to matters of doctrine. So by the third century, 300 years later, somebody's saying, hey, I have the authority to tell you what, what the right doctrine is. You should come here and ask me. However, nobody else acknowledges this authority. 
It's only the guy in Rome claiming it, which sounds kind of empty. You know, there's a dude in Mexico, even right now, claiming he's Jesus. That doesn't really do much for you, though, unless, I mean, it's more impressive if everybody else agrees. <laughs> or if perhaps the Bible doesn't go against people claiming they're Jesus. Jesus is like, hey, when I come, you'll know. <laughs> now, by the 6th century... Uh, this is not the case. I'm not sure what Pastor Mike's referring to here, 2nd century or 300 years later. Our third century, 300 years. Third century would be 200 years later. Maybe he's saying it's not till the time of Constantine, the fourth century, you know, roughly 300 years or so after Pentecost. Uh, but that's not what the historical record bears out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, when you see uh, about this papal authority at the very at the end of the first century, Clement exercises his authority to the church in Corinth. So the Roman Church exercises its authority to the Corinthians, even while the Apostle John was alive. So the Apostle John was alive, living near this area, and yet Clement is the one who intervenes and warns them about not obeying his authority, the authority of the Roman Church, to uh, put the deposed elders, the leaders of the Church who have been deposed, back to the rightful place. In fact, Clement, Bishop of Rome, Clement and Soter, the letter of Clement and the letter of Pope Soter, were considered so important in the early Church that they were read inside Church services alongside sacred scripture. So the writings of the Bishop of Rome were considered that important. They were read in church alongside Scripture itself. And at the end of the second century, Pope Victor I excommunicated a bunch of churches, and they knew they were excommunicated. Irenaeus told Victor, hey, you shouldn't excommunicate them, but he recognized Victor had the authority to excommunicate them based on the fact that they weren't celebrating Easter on the proper date. That's part of what's called the quarto deciman controversy in the early church about what calendar, what dating system should we use to celebrate Easter. Uh, so it's a t subject for a different video, but here Pope Victor is exercising his authority at the end of the second century, still long before uh, Pastor Winger says the papacy uh, came into existence. Uh, let's see. Well, I think he'll, he'll probably bring up Ir Irenaeus here shortly. Let's continue. The church in Rome was exercising jurisdiction over other churches, and thus the Roman Catholic Church was born. Now we begin to see something like you would call it, that's the Roman Catholic Church, right around that time, the 6th century. Way too late. Absolutely way too late. I mean, I was even reading J.N.D. Kelly the other night, his Oxford Dictionary of Popes, and he's an Anglican scholar. But he recognizes this authority long before in the 2nd century, early 3rd century. He goes so far as to say Pope Innocent I at the beginning of the 5th century was the first true pope having a plethora of different kind of sovereign accounts over the church. Of course, I would disagree with Kelly on that point, but he puts it in like the year 400, not in like the 500s or 550s. Uh, no, no scholar puts the papacy originating at, at that time. And, and we have evidence far earlier of uh, Rome having much more authority in the church than that. So you go to, Irena uh, go to Irenaeus. Uh, St. Irenaeus says of the, the church at Rome, it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church. Remember, this is writing about the year 180 AD, end of the second century. On account of its preeminent authority, that is, the faithful everywhere, inasmuch as the tradition has been preserved continuously by those faithful men who exist everywhere. It's a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church, the church at Rome, on account of its preeminent authority. Eventually, the Roman Catholic Church started to claim that only if you're directly in submission to the Pope can you be saved. And that was a new thing. It was not original. It was very new. Most scholars say the beginning of the Catholic Church was about 590 AD. And it's not like this clear-cut thing. It was a slow evolution over time. But if you're going to have to put a date on it, 590 AD is, is as good a date as any. And when the That is a late date, to be sure. Uh, we can find attestations of papal... Uh, authority long before that point. Uh, let's try the 4th century, for example. St. Basil the Great and Athanasius, they needed the the Pope's intervention, the Bishop of Rome, to deal with the dispute about Arian bishops in the East, and they sought, his, they sought his intercession in the matter because he had preeminence and primacy over them. Uh, you go to St. Jerome, writing to Pope Damasus. Uh, this is what he says, long before 590 AD. As I follow no leader save Christ... So I communicate with none but your blessedness, that is, with the chair of Peter. For this, I know, is the rock on which the church is built. All right, so let's, uh, <laughs> long before 590. I think what he's talking about here, and of course you go all the way back to St. Ignatius of Antioch, as was the Catholic Church was born. St. Ignatius of Antioch used the phrase the Catholic Church in the year 110 AD, said where the bishop is, that is where the Catholic Church is, kataholos, according to the whole. 
I think maybe Pastor Winger is picking 590 as the time when the Pope's authority also included having military power and more temporal authority, which makes sense, not entirely, but I mean, for the first 400 years of the Church's history, uh, you know, for the first 300 years, the Church was basically persecuted. Then the Church was growing after its legalization under the Roman Empire. Then you have the collapse of the Roman Empire, not on the exact date, but historians pick 476, the sacking of, what is it, Alaric I? sacking Rome, 476 AD. So it's pure chaos. And so the Bishop of Rome and the Roman Church is now able to aspire as the, the Christendom rises in the fall of the Roman Empire, and we see the, the emergence of Christendom. The Pope is able to attain more of having even military authority it didn't have under the Roman Empire, under the, the Roman Emperor. So that might be what he's talking about. But the Pope had ecclesial and jurisdictional authority long before 590 AD. And the Catholic Church, of course, is recognized as the Catholic Church, 500 years uh, before that. Leader of the Church in Rome, Gregory I, expanded the authority of the Church to include, check this out, military and civil power. And he set the Church on a new course. Um, so Gregory's like, hey, yeah, I, I, get, I get to control the government too. Yeah, because Christ is king. Christ is king. Christ is king of the universe, which includes the earth, which includes temporal affairs. So the Church, in understanding its role at this time in history, especially with the fall of the Roman Empire, the Church, Christendom, its job was to maintain civilization, to keep the barbarian hordes at bay. That is what its role was. Christ, Christ is king now, and the Church exercises its sovereignty in the absence of the Roman Empire. And that's the claim of the Catholic Church. And there's been times in history where the Catholic Church was in control of the governments, and other times where the government was in control of the Catholic Church, taking a pope out of office, putting a new pope in, kind of a puppet, um, and it went, kind of went back and forth, depending on who had more power at the time. Rome's claim to supremacy in legal jurisdiction, it was vigorously resisted. Yeah, so we had lay investiture controversy of uh, secular leaders appointing uh, uh, bishops and those who held their offices uh, at that you know at that time. But the church recognized that apostolic continuity, apostolic succession, still emerges even if the king says, "I want this person to be bishop." If the person is validly consecrated by other bishops, they're a bishop, uh, and God is able to work through these kinds of uh, secular thorns that appear in the church's side resisted by other churches. In fact, it was never able to be enforced in the eastern part of the whole empire. A whole chunk of the Roman Empire where the churches there said, we, don't, we, don't, we do not acknowledge your claim to have authority over us. Eventually, it led to the first major split called the first schism, or the first schism, depending on where you're from. And this was in 1054, or schism, I guess, if you really want to. I like schism, <laughs> kind of nice, nice ring to it. Uh, in 1054, the first schism, or what uh, in Roman... Schism would be like the scholastic philosophers or um the the architect got me those good schematics but um maybe it's a hebrew way of pronouncing it i i don't know i'm not gonna make fun because I, I mispronounce things all the time what do i do bad irrevocable i think that's irrevocable palatable palatable i'm so bad <laughs> so i don't i don't give him grief on on that but let's let's the east the part he's talking about here about the east by the way grossly oversimplified the, the Eastern Empire, because of differences in language, tradition, and custom, and not mutual understanding and tolerance or different ways of celebrating the faith, uh, led to the churches growing apart. There wasn't a day or a year that the churches grew apart. Even hundreds of years after the Great Schism, there would have been people worshiping in the Eastern Empire who thought they were still under the Pope and didn't know it had happened. If you want a good history of that, get Ada Nichols' book, Rome and the Eastern Churches. Very good book I recommend on, on that subject. If you want to, and if you have an affinity for the East and you're interested in the Catholic faith, check out an Eastern Catholic church. There's all kinds of different ones. Uh, you know, there's if you're in, in India, you have Syro Malabar, you got Maronite, you got Chaldean, you got Byzantine that I go to. So if you are an Eastern Orthodox watching, want to learn more about the Catholic faith, uh, try an Eastern Catholic church. Especially if, you, if you're in San Diego, come to my church. You'll feel right at home. We've got an Iconostas, we've got married clergy, we've got, uh, you know, we've got infant communion. We don't even have pews, no pews at all. So think about it. Roman Catholic history, they call it the Great Schism. And this was when the whole Eastern Church just like boop, broke away from the Catholic Church in Rome. The Church in the East went on to become known as the Eastern Orthodox Church, also known as the Greek Orthodox Church. And they were like, you guys are, you guys are just getting more and more power hungry and we're out of here. We do, not, we do not agree with your claims to have this power. And they broke off and they've never come back. Now the Church is working. Some of them came back. 
the church I attend, the Ruthenian and a lot of the other churches that were Eastern Orthodox, eventually came back into full communion with Rome, and that's where these Eastern churches emerged from. So it's super sad, by the way, when there's, uh, like, dis- by the- and once again, it was not boop and they disappeared. It was building centuries, and there were centuries of fallout. Uh, you know, the fall of the sacking of Constantinople by Western Crusaders, you know, is still a sore spot in history between the East and the West. Um, but when you when you look at it, we have to have uh, a, a genuine spirit of ecumenism and understanding with our Eastern brethren. A bishop, a Catholic bishop in the U.S., John Ireland, is considered the founder of Eastern Orthodox in the United States because he wouldn't recognize the valid holy orders of an Eastern Catholic priest who came to serve in his diocese, and he wouldn't recognize him. You're Eastern, I, I, you're married. I don't I remember if he was married or not. He probably was, but he didn't recognize him, and he treated him so harshly. That guy ended up founding the the Eastern Orthodox Church in the United States. So, we all have to learn. Ecumenism is not a bad word. It can be misused, but we have to recognize genuine commonalities we have with each other, so we can move together closer to be unified as the one body in Christ that Jesus wants for us. Really hard in this century and in the latter part of the 1900s to create, a, a, make a bigger umbrella of the Roman Catholic Church to try to say, hey, um, you don't have to agree with us, but we can still sort of fellowship with each other. And they're, they're just trying to increase their influence in a whole different style than they used to. Before it was like, come under our authority. Now it's like, um, sort of agree with us and about certain things and, and just let bygones be bygones kind of thing. It's a different. That's progress. Ecumenical progress. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Strategy. The Roman Church is, is, is evolving, continuing today to evolve. The next major split in the church happened in Wittenberg, Germany on, well, it started on October 31st, which we might know as Halloween, in 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses, his statements about issues he thought were in the Catholic Church. Now, he was not trying to start a reformation or a revolution. He was just trying to say, and this was an acceptable way of doing it, hey, let's talk about these issues. Uh, True and false. True. He was not trying to start a reformation. False. And it's an apocryphal story. Most people believe it. He didn't actually, there's very little evidence he actually nailed the theses on the door. That's kind of more of a story that's developed. But yeah, he wasn't trying to start a reformation. That, that's it. And he wasn't, sorry, he wasn't trying to start, he was trying genuine reformation, but it eventually turned into revolution, breaking away from the church. The real reformation happened at the Council of Trent. Where have I heard that before? So check that out to see real reformation where the church saw, hey, these Luther's right. Some of these priests are horribly formed. We have to reform seminaries. We have to reform the training of priests. We, you know, we we yeah, have to get rid of the you know so many things that have to be changed to make sure priests are properly formed. The Council of Trent is reformation. Protestantism is revolution. He thought the Catholic Church should be adjusted back to biblical standards, and that indulgences and purgatory and um, uh, the power of the Pope, and most importantly, the gospel message. These things have been lost or distorted or added for no reason by the Catholic Church. And so he wrote the 95 Thesis, and uh, I encourage you to read it sometime. But we do not, as Christians today, trace our roots to Martin Luther. I just want to say this. I am not a follower of Martin Luther. The whole point of the Reformation is go to the Bible. That's the point. We didn't trade the Pope for Pope Luther. That is not what Luther and Calvin thought, by the way. They did not think, especially Calvin, who believed in high church authority, just not his authority, just not the Pope's authority that Protestants still believe in a church authority similar to the Catholic Church. Look at the Anglican Church, still very similar uh, in comparison. Uh, What Pastor Mike is arguing, yeah, you're right, it's not early Protestantism, it's later, like, 19th century, late 19th century Restorationists who said, hey, forget everything we've heard the last, you know, 300 years. We need to go back to the Bible and restore the church that was lost in the first century. That's He's starting to sound more like, like Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses do, like, go back to the Bible and, and find that that source, ignoring the theological developments we've had since then. That's not what we did. And so I'm not going to be here quoting a bunch of Luther and Calvin and other, and other Reformation leaders as though I want to compare like their councils with Catholic councils and combat them. And I just think that's radically confusing. And I just want to go to the scriptures. And I think that you'll be relieved to know that we're not going to do that. (laughs) Um, Now we would, uh, I think we can say and conclude this, the Roman church, considers themselves as a continuation of an essentially unchanged organization that's been going on since the time of Jesus and Peter, and that is utterly false. The papacy was a gradual development that went through many different stages, slowly claiming more and more authority for themselves, slowly gaining the ability to enforce that authority, and then causing great schism when they did. 
But we're always going to develop our understanding of the authority of that which we put our trust into. For Protestants, they do the same thing with the Bible. If you look at biblical theology, it has developed over the centuries. Because I would say, Pastor Mike, your understanding of Scripture, how it's inspired, how it's inerrant, how it's formed, what what should we understand, how it's been transmitted to us over time, uh, and our ways of understanding it and translating it and what its meaning is, that has developed over the centuries. So, of course, if, if you're allowed to develop things like biblical theology— if your biblical theology is allowed to develop so we have a richer understanding of the Bible 2,000 years after it was written, shouldn't the Church be allowed, the Catholic Church be allowed to have developments in ecclesiology and our understanding of what the Church is? Um, it, it should be fair for, for both sides on this. And not having a biblical grounding for it. Today's Roman Catholicism is radically different than the Church in Rome in even 800 AD, 500 AD, 300 AD or closer to the time of the apostles. It's just very, very different. They would not recognize it. The apostles would not recognize this. So, um, Well, I would just challenge Pastor Mike uh, to read Justin Martyr, his apology, Defense to Rome, and his description of the Mass. When you read Justin Martyr's description of the Mass in First Apology, uh, it is beat for beat. Uh, not in every single part, that he didn't have, Justin Martyr did not have the general instruction of the Roman Missal we have today, but the major elements of the Mass are there, and a believer today who went into that Mass 2,000 years ago would be able to follow along. The same elements are, are going through. So, yeah, we've, we've unfolded in the details, but the essential elements of the faith are still there. With the time I have left, I want to get into what I think is the heart of the issue. I think that, that that clearly cuts the pillar out, right? You are not historically Christian. You are not biblically Christian. Where is your authority? You can't get it from the fathers, and you can't get it from the Bible. Where do you get it? From your claims for authority, and therefore, you don't have any. Jesus himself did not say, oh, I'm just going to come and show up with authority. He was like, no, I got witnesses, and I got this affirmations, I got this proof. He offered his miracles as proof, he offered John the Baptist testimony as proof, and he offered the Old Testament prophecy as proof. He was like, even me, I'm going to be grounded in evidence from the scriptures you've already received, and I do not see that evidence in the Bible. And so, there you go. And that pillar goes away, which means now I can say, Catholic Church, what are your teachings? I can test them with this now, because I don't believe you have the authority to just tell me what to believe. Well, but Jesus, yes, he appealed to prophecy. He appealed to his miracles. But remember, Jesus also said, they said this, others have said this, but I say to you, Jesus appealed to his own authority all the time. He didn't rely on just entire other authorities to vouch for him. He did have that. But he said, but I say to you. He spoke of his own authority. In fact, that's why the people were amazed by him. They said, this man speaks of his own authority and not like the scribes. And so the church speaks of its own authority, but not solely its own authority. It's not like we say, well, we're Catholic. We're, we're the, we're the uh, you know, successors of the apostles and because we say so. Rather, no, here is what the Bible says. It accords with what we teach. Here is the testimony of history showing this unbroken chain, this historical continuity for 2,000 years. So we, as Catholics, we appeal to the Bible and we appeal to history, and the Church from that, you can rationally see the claims that, that the Church makes in regards. It's not just some kind of uh, metaphorical pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps or something like that. If anything, Protestants do that by saying, these writings are the inspired Word of God because, we, because they are the inspired Word of God and they are our sole authority. That's more speaking out of authority fiat, or a kind of engaging in a circular argument in that regard. Well, the gospel is the number one issue there. The foundation of the Roman Catholic Church is that of claim to authority, but the gospel, the gospel is the most important issue altogether. I want to cover this in general because, the, oh gosh, the gospel in, in, in Rome, the Roman Catholic Church is radically complicated, and I doubt you could get a, a, a Catholic theologian to even summarize the gospel for you. I'll be like, yeah, we've all sinned. Repent, put your faith in Jesus Christ. He died and rose for your sins. You're saved. Like, just believe, you know, and it's really simple. And you can kind of just summarize the gospel of Jesus Christ in lots of different ways, in really short sentences, but not the gospel of Catholicism. But let's start with... Uh, first, just because you can summarize something and make it simple doesn't mean it's correct. Here's something simple. The universe is an accident, and then after you die, nothing happens. That's simple, but Pastor Mike will agree it's wrong, because uh, he's not an atheist. Just because you can make something simple doesn't mean that it's true. And just because something cannot be simplified does not mean that it's not true. Or if you do simplify it, you're going to have to leave out extraneous elements and you simplify it. Like I'm working on a book right now on how to get saved from a Catholic perspective. 
And so here's how I would tell someone, this is how you get saved. If you want salvation and you're asking for salvation, there's just four things you have to do. Repent, believe, receive, remain. Repent, believe in Jesus, receive Jesus, remain in Jesus. That's it. That's all you have to do. Well, what does it mean to receive Jesus? What does it mean to remain in Jesus? Well, there's more to it. Just like I could say to Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? Do I have to believe he's the Son of God? Do I have to believe he is God, he is fully divine? Or can I just believe that he is God-like? You know, he's like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Well, you, you have to have this belief about Jesus. It gets more complicated when you start asking questions. So the Catholic view can be summarized, but there's more to it. And that's okay, because that's the salvific plan God has given to us. With the Gospel of the Bible. So turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Because we agree with Catholics that everybody has sinned, and that hell is the destiny for sinners, and that we need forgiveness and righteousness in order to get to heaven. The disagreement is on how that happens. But what does the Bible say? Let's go through some scriptures. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is, it is, here's the gospel, the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel is that you can be saved and given righteousness by believing in Jesus. And man, that is peaceful. That is comforting. That is so wonderful. <laughs> I am at peace because of what he has done and not because of what I have done. Philippians 3.9 says this. Okay, let's talk about Romans. So first, I forgot another slide when we talked about authority long before 590. Look at St. Augustine, who many Protestants look up to. For my part, St. Augustine said, I should not believe the gospel. We're talking about the gospel here. Why believe in the gospel? Augustine said, for my part, I should not believe the gospel except as moved by the authority of the Catholic Church. All right, let's see. We'll go to Romans chapter, Romans 1, 16 through 17. Here's the problem. The word faith here, okay, doesn't just mean belief in something. Just as what I believe. That's not the word faith. The Greek word pistis and the Hebrew word echemuna are deeper than that. The Protestant scholar Don Garlington says, righteousness does consist of pistis, pistis, in the expansive sense of hemuna, the Hebrew word for faith, that is covenant conformity. That is, you just belong to this new covenant. Whether Jew or Greek, you belong to that. You belong to it, not having to become a Jew first before you become a Christian. But it is by faith in Jesus Christ you can be received into this covenant community through the replacement of circumcision, which is baptism, as Colossians 2 says, which is the, the replacement we have for, for baptism, to die and rise with Christ. Also, Romans 1.17, a better translation of the passage is not uh, he who has faith or he lives by faith, but he who through faith is righteous shall live. That's the better translation of Romans 117, which you find in the RSV, both the Protestant version and the Catholic version of Romans 117. It's he who through faith is righteous shall live. So it's not just having faith. It's not faith alone. Faith alone is only found in James chapter 2, where faith alone is condemned. We're not justified by faith alone. But he who through faith, they're righteous not of their own merits, but by faith in Christ, we are righteous through his merits. He who through faith is righteous shall live. That's what Paul is saying here. And he says that just the same here in Romans. Oops, I forgot. In M. See? A good work there. I, I corrected it. It says, God will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing. In Greek, it literally th says patience in well-doing. Well-doing is ergu agathu, which is literally good work. He who by patience and good works seeks for glory and honor and immortality, he, God, will give eternal life. So let's see if we have... Um, well, 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 I'll talk about this, about the nature of salvation as we go forward, but Romans 1, 16 through 17 does not prove salvation by faith alone. Faith is essential, but not by its own, divorced from any kind of work or cooperation with grace and reception with the sacraments. That's over-reading into the text, to try to get sola fide out of Romans 1, 16 through 17. Uh, Paul speaking of, of this, and he says, and being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that, the righteousness, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith, that we get righteous by faith. There's a big piece of the gospel right there. We just get righteous by faith, as it said in Romans 1. And then in Romans 5, and you can turn back. To by faith. 
Faith is an essential element, but it is not the only element when it pertains to our righteousness and how we receive that from God. Turn to Romans. We'll be there for a few verses here. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, having been justified, justified. How? How do I get justified? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then it goes on to say that this hope does not disappoint, just in case it was like thinking, I hope I'm saved. No, it's, I'm, I'm confident. This hope does not disappoint. We're justified. We have peace now, peace in my heart with the Lord, because I know all my sins were paid for on Calvary. Every sin I've ever done or will do. Right. Through faith, we have peace with God having been justified. But this assumes that justification is a single moment with irreversible effects. And that's not the case. So let's look at the Catholic view of salvation to understand this. So the Catechism says in paragraph uh, 2010, 2010, says, Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. Nobody merits it. No, you can't. It's only by grace, not even through faith. We can't do anything to merit the initial grace we receive at, at our, our initial conversion. That's something all we can do is simply receive it. And then through faith, we recognize it, and we want to hold fast to it. And to receive that, the way we receive it, is through baptism. As Paul says in Romans 6, 2 through 3, that we die with Christ in baptism, and then we are raised with him in there as well. We die buried with Christ, die with him, and rise with him in baptism. But then Paul goes on to say, so justification is not a one-time irreversible moment, because in Romans eleven twenty two, Paul says to take care uh, God, in his kindness, has grafted people into the new covenant who at once didn't belong, like the Gentiles. And if you want to persevere in God's kindness, continue to do so, knowing God's severity, that you too can be cut off. So, yeah, we have peace with God, Romans 5, 1 through 2, but peace is not something that can, can't be broken. The U.S. has peace with Japan ever since World War II. That doesn't mean we could never go to war again if we went and just bombed them, you know, and committed an act of... Uh, belligerence against them. So we do have peace. The question is, shall we be obedient to God, living through faith, righteousness lived through faith, to live in obedience to God so that we remain in his peace? Or will we rupture that peace? So this view of sola fide saying, especially the view that you can't lose your salvation because there's this irreversible peace that's attained through justification by faith alone, that's not supported with the, with the biblical evidence. So let's continue on was dealt with by that one moment on the cross through Jesus Christ. And wow, I have peace. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22 says this. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. To, on, to all and on all who believe. In Romans 3, 28, Skip down a few verses. He says, therefore, we conclude, here's the point he's getting out in Romans 3, that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Now, notice this, that the deeds of the law would include things like loving your neighbor, which is written in the law. It would include not only circumcision and all that, but it would include just the kind of be a nice guy type stuff, you know, and do things for God and serve the Lord in your life. Like this type of thing would be included in the deeds of the law. And I'm justified apart from those things, apart from me being a wonderful person or a good guy. Romans chapter 4 Okay, so let's talk about the, the works of the law. What is, what is Paul getting at here when he's talking about works of the law? These are works that were done in obedience to the Mosaic law. So they included the ritual aspects of the law, like circumcision, the kosher law. And Pastor Mike is half right. This also included the moral prescripts of the law. But what Paul is not saying here is that we're justified by faith and we don't need anything from the works of the law, anything from the, the Torah in order to be justified with God. We don't need any of that. That's a fallacy. That's like saying, I can be healthy without drinking Diet Coke. I can't. In fact, you're healthier without Diet Coke, frankly. Uh, saccharin's going to kill your brain cells. But that doesn't follow that I can be healthy without any of the stuff that makes up Diet Coke. Because what is the major ingredient in Diet Coke? Water. It's carbonated water. If I don't drink water, I will die. So yeah, I don't need Diet Coke, but there's essential elements within it that I do need that I would drink, and I don't drink them because I secretly want Diet Coke again, is because I recognize that those elements have an enduring quality to them. And so the same way when we talk about the works of the law, the big thing Paul is concerned here, it's not about people who thought they could get their way to heaven by works, and he's saying, no, you use faith, not works. 
It was about the Jew-Gentile distinction in the church. That was his concern. People who were saying that you need to obey the Torah, even the Ten Commandments, not because they're the eternal moral law of God, but because they're the Torah. You have, to, you have to be a good Jew to be a good Christian. Paul was saying that's not true. And we know that's what Paul meant because look at the verses after Romans 3.28. Paul says, We hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? His point is not about believing versus doing good works. Good works were essential to Paul for salvation for our righteousness. Not that our works earn salvation, but that in persevering in good works, specifically not the bad works of darkness, is what keeps us from being unjustified. That's the key here. And Paul talks about that later in his letter to the Romans. Rather, what he's concerned about is the Jew-Gentile distinction in the early church. So a person was not justified if they followed the Ten Commandments because they are in the Torah and they want to be a good Jew. That doesn't lead to justification. What leads to justification is faith in Christ, faith, pistis, which means covenant conformity. So it's more like the word faith, I've seen other Protestant authors use this, be more like allegiance. We're saved by allegiance alone to Christ. And if faith is broader in the sense of allegiance, then even a Catholic could sign on to justification by faith alone. Pope Benedict XVI once said that Luther's formula, we're saved by faith alone, is correct if faith is not divorced from charity, if faith includes righteousness that is lived out in faith. Verses 1 through 8, let's just read this together. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? Now, it was important when Paul wrote Romans, he was like saying, I've got to not only tell you what Jesus said, what the apostles teach, but I've got to tell you how it's consistent with the Old Testament, that even Abraham was saved by faith, apart from works. So, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. Now, he's quoting the Old Testament here, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. <gasps> the Old Testament says Abraham just believed and God gave him righteousness? What? Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. If you work, then you are owed what you get paid. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart. Okay, let's talk about Abraham a little bit here. First, what Paul is saying about the boasting, it's not about doing works to please God. That's not about what Abraham and the righteousness Abraham received. Paul was rebuking the idea that Abraham, well, N.T. Wright puts it this way, who a Protestant Anglican scholar. N.T. Wright says, Paul is ruling out any suggestion that Abraham, in Romans 4, Abraham might have been just the sort of person God was looking for, so that there might be some merit prior to the promise, in other words, some kind of boast. So it was not Abraham was justified because of his lineage, like how Jews in Paul's time would say they were justified because of their lineage, because Abraham ain't got no lineage. He's got nothing. God just chose him. But Abraham received that, listened to the call, obeyed God, and Abraham's justification was a process. It was not just a single moment. Uh, when we look, uh, for example, Abraham was justified before he answered God's call and the new covenant, the covenant he wanted to call him to in Genesis 15. How do we know that? Go to the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews 11.8 says that Abraham, what he did so, he did so through a faith which, according to verse 2, men of old received divine approval that he was justified before Genesis 15, in Genesis chapter 12. Apart from works, could it be more clear? Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So I do not get imputed my sin, but instead I get imputed righteousness. He just gives me righteousness. And in this passage, which when I read to a friend of mine, who might be watching this video at some point. So hi, Tony, if you're watching the video. Um, I don't know if he remembers this conversation or not, but it went like this. We talked for hours about the gospel, and, and he's Catholic, great guy. He's a Catholic friend of mine. We were discussing the differences, you know. And uh, I, I quoted him Ephesians 2, but I didn't tell him I was quoting the Bible. I said, but Tony, the Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And his response was, now, Mike, that would be scary if that was in the Bible. And then I proceeded to pull it out and read it to him, and I'll read it to you again, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And Tony re responded, Mike, I don't think it means what you think it means. And I go, Tony, I never told you what I thought it meant. You just said it'd be scary if it was in the Bible. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was a kind of a fun moment. But the idea here is that we're saved by grace apart from works, and works come later. Works are a result of my salvation. They don't get me saved. I like the equation like this, right? Faith, faith saves. 
right? Faith saves. So if we were to put it sort of in a math format, the, the gospel would be like faith in Christ equals salvation plus works. They, it, they come naturally as a result of your salvation. But the Roman Catholic gospel is very different than this. It's going to say faith plus works equals salvation. And it's on the other side of the equation that I need to, I need to earn my salvation. But that goes in the face of so much scripture and even examples of people being saved. Uh, the church does not teach that our salvation is just some kind of haphazard combination of faith and works. Rather, we are saved by grace. We receive God's grace, and we are saved when you are baptized. Nothing would hinder you from entering into heaven upon being baptized. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing else you have to do. The only, there's only one thing you have to do. Don't reject the grace. Don't commit a mortal sin. So there's no good work we do after baptism to go into heaven. There's just a, the old one, there's one good work, avoiding the bad work of falling into a mortal sin. And a lot of Catholics and Protestants, honestly, were using different language to describe it, but Pastor Mike would agree that after being saved, a Christian does not become an abortionist, he doesn't become a Muslim, uh, he, you know, he doesn't become a blasphemer, he doesn't become a Muslim blasphemer that performs abortions. Uh, he'll say, well, that's because he is saved. I don't think that's how we really, the struggles we deal with in the spiritual life, the warnings against losing salvation that the New Testament copiously describes, it just doesn't fit this view of, well, works are just something that flows from our salvation, like how light flows from the sun. It, it, I think we know deep down, both from the biblical evidence and the personal evidence, that's just not what happens. Now let's look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. So, having been saved through faith, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. So there's a distinction here. Notice the distinction between, because wouldn't it, shouldn't it say, not because of works, lest any man should boast, we were created in Christ Jesus for works, which God repaired beforehand. But there's a difference. There are good works, and there are works. Odds are, what Paul means by works here are works of the law. Once again, the Jew-Gentile distinction rears its head. That's what Paul is concerned about. Not works versus faith, but being Jewish versus being Gentile. That is his concern. And we know that because look at the other verses after Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. What is Paul talking about? Hey, you guys trying to earn salvation through works. Don't you know it's through faith? That is not Paul's elaboration. Instead, he says, Remember, at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Uh, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. So he's talking about the Gentiles were far from God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near in the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. He made us both one, broken down the dividing wall of hostility, abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances. It was the things keeping the Gentiles from God by saying they had to be Jewish first. That is what has been abolished. In fact, the dividing wall, as some believe, is a reference to the wall in the temple in Jerusalem that divided the Gentiles from the Jews, and the court of the Gentiles from where the Jews worshipped. Uh, but instead, no, that is the works of the law, having to become Jewish before you even become Christian, that has been abolished. Not works themselves and their importance, not that they earn our salvation, but it is through them we maintain our obedience to the new covenant that we are under. The Catholic doctrine of justification is radically complicated, and I'm not going to get into all the details. So I'm going to try to summarize it for you, and I hope I can do this and catch the heart of it and be very accurate in the way I do this. But if I can say that salvation is not by grace alone through faith alone, according to the Catholic Church, being justified or declared righteous is a process that begins at the moment of baptism and then progresses and is maintained by a person's participation in what are called the seven sacraments, or basically through works. Through works. They don't deny grace. They simply add works with grace. Well, no, you don't have to, you don't need every sacrament to be saved. Like, if you never become a priest, or you never get married, you will still be saved. Uh, even if you never ended up receiving the sacrament of confirmation. I mean, lots of children are baptized, and they don't, they don't end up being confirmed, but they would still go to heaven. The two most important sacraments when it comes to the nature of salvation would be, do you keep the commandment to keep the Lord's day holy? The sa keep the Sabbath holy? And that would mean attending Mass, or obeying the Third Commandment, and we're obeying the Church that God gave us in Jesus' command when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. So we have to receive, at least once a year, Christ in the Eucharist, because Jesus told us to. It's not a work we do to, like, please God or something. It's, it, and it is pleasing, 
But it's something we do because we're part of God's new covenant, and we obey God, and he told us to do this. And then if we ever sin grievously against God, we seek forgiveness. I would say that Mike, Pastor Mike, if he, if he did something horrible, I hope he would ask God for forgiveness. It's funny, a lot of Protestants will say, well, all my sins were covered. They're all forgiven. Okay, well, Jesus said in the Our Father, you're supposed to pray every day, forgive us our trespasses. Why would I ask forgiveness for a sin that's already been forgiven? It'd be like if I had a friend who said, hey, by the way, Trent, for the rest of the week while you're visiting, all the meals are on me. Oh, thank you, Mike, whoever that might be. Uh, But imagine if every meal I kept saying, hey, uh, can I pay for this? Hey, can I pay for this? Hey, can I pay for this? That would almost be like ingratitude if I kept offering to pay when he said, no, all your meals are taken care of. They're all paid for. I should, I would just accept it then. If I kept offering, that'd be weird, right? Well, if all of our sins are forgiven, why would we keep asking for forgiveness for our sins having, you know, if they've all been forgiven in one fell swoop? No, instead, if we commit a mortal sin, we are restored to communion with God through the sacrament of reconciliation. So it's just a misunderstanding here about how grace and the sacraments give us that grace, and just lumping it in together and calling it all works is an in- inaccurate way of uh, talking about it. So the Catholic Church will say, yes, you're saved by grace. Yes, we need to be saved by grace. And works. The Council of Trent is relevant here because it's, of course, this is current Catholic doctrine, and it's one of the probably one of the best known councils of the Church, and they were very clear on these things. So let me read to you just two quotes from this council that talk about their understanding of how people are saved. From Trent, Canon 32 over here, it says, if anyone says that the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God, that they are not also the good merits of him justified, or that the one justified by the good works that he performs by the grace of God and the merits of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and in case he dies in grace, in case he dies in grace, that attainment of eternal life itself, and also an increase of glory, let him be anathema. So in other words, if you don't say that that works add to your salvation and help you maintain it and assure it, then then you're, you're anathema. Yeah, because God is our Father, and when we do good works, remember Ephesians 2.10, good works that have been prepared beforehand for us, that pleases God. So our righteousness is like a light within us. Remember Jesus said, light your lamp so the whole household can see? Only God can light it. He can, he's like the pilot light in the furnace. Only he can light it. But when we cooperate with God's grace for the good works he has prepared for us, the light gets brighter. It gets brighter for others to see. And when we don't, it can get dimmer. And eventually we can snuff it out if we commit a mortal sin. Now, a lot of Protestants reject these kinds of analogies, but they're faithful to the Bible. And the thing is, our works themselves are not pleasing to God because they are works. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, w- if we did them on our own merits, they would be like filthy rags, as the, pro- as the prophet Isaiah says. Rather, it's because we are God's children. Like when my kids clean up at home, they don't do the best job cleaning up, but I'm pleased with them because they are my children. And... I love them because they're my children, and they obeyed me as, per, as imperfectly as they do obey. I love them, and God does the same thing with us. And so our works, we do, do not earn our ticket to heaven, but they do increase the light that Christ has lit within us as a part of the righteousness we have received through the sacraments, which ultimately come through faith through him, which ultimately come from his grace that we accept into our lives. Um, then it says, if anyone saith that the justice received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that he, uh, that the said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema, which is basically, I'm anathema, because what I just read to you guys earlier and said, that it's, it's, it is a sign, it's, it's, it's evidence of my salvation, but it's not what causes my salvation. Yeah, and works don't cause us to be saved, but they do increase our righteousness when they are done to please God. Uh, they, and so this is something that many Protestants say, yeah, well, we call that sanctification, not justification. So a lot of times we're quibbling over, over the terms here. But it's important to understand that because Paul says in Romans chapter 2, he says it's not the hearers of the law who will be justified, it's the doers. And that God will reward with glory, honor, and immortality those who persevere in ergu agatu, good works. God will reward that. But we are not saved because God said, hey, you did good works, I'm going to save you but well, because we graciously accepted his offer to be a part of his new covenant, and then we obey him and we have allegiance to him, we remain in that covenant. Repent, believe, receive, remain. A sneak peek of my new book on how to get saved. Hopefully it'll be out in maybe a year or so. So working on writing it now. Very excited for that to come out to you guys. Trent also said this. If anyone says that the justice received... Oh, excuse me. Um... 
argue about that. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, I'm trying to avoid reading too much of the content from the uh, from the councils only because it is difficult to follow. So I'm, I'm just. I'm not saying trust me, go look it up on your own, go ahead. But the basic statement is this. Justification is a process that starts with baptism, but you're not totally saved yet. There's all these sacraments you have to do. You have to do a lot of good works in order to be saved. That's the point. And because of this, justification is a process as opposed to the biblical belief like, man, you're saved, you're saved. Right? That's the idea. I'm saved, I'm forgiven. But in Catholic uh, teaching, it's a process. That's not the biblical idea. Go to 1 Corinthians 15.2. St. Paul says, for those of us who are being saved. Romans 13, 11, Paul says, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Paul saw salvation as a process. Justification is a process, not a moment. Process, and it has to, I have to continue working at it and working at it, and I never really know for sure what, whether I've got it or not. That's the second problem. Justification in the Catholic Church, salvation, is uncertain. You are not sure you're saved. It's possible in Roman Catholic theology to have faith in Jesus, but not be good enough to be saved. That's a legitimate People are in that spot. You believe in Jesus, but you have sinned too much, and so you're not saved. You need more good works. It is also... That's what Jesus himself said. The Bible says it's possible to believe in Jesus and not be saved. Let's go here. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Who... But notice not... He doesn't say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who really believed in me was a true believer. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's about what we do that confirms what we truly believe, but they work hand in hand. They're not separate. They're not on different sides of the equation. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you evil doers. So it's quite possible for someone to believe in Jesus and not be saved. This idea that Protestants have uh, psychological security, like, well, I know I'm saved. I have this security. You're just trading one psychological insecurity for another. If, you, if For the Catholic who is worried, am I saved? The Protestant will always worry, was I really saved in the past? Did I really get saved or was it a false conversion? So they're both insecure, but I prefer the knowledge as a Catholic of that I can know if I am in a state of grace right now. I can't know the past. If, you know, was I really saved in the past? Did it really take place? I know who I am right now if I'm in a state of grace or not. That's what's important for us to be able to take inventory of. Temporary. Salvation, according to Roman Catholic theology, is a temporary issue. It can be lost in a moment when you commit something called a mortal sin. You're not saved. You lost all of the grace that Jesus has given you when you committed that mortal sin. It's gone, just like that. I wonder, what would Pastor Mike do if someone in his congregation said, Pastor Mike, I went and had an abortion, I knew it was wrong, but I feel like I'm going to go to hell. Would he say, no, you're saved, Nothing. you, you can't lose your salvation? I'm sure he'd want to say you should ask God for forgiveness. I don't, well, I don't know. I would love to hear his answer as how he would counsel someone in his church who came to him to say, well, you're, you know— or would he say, well, because you went and did that, he wouldn't call it a mortal sin, but he operates the same way, I bet. Because you went and did that, that proves you weren't saved in the first place. So you have to recommit yourself to Christ. You weren't really saved. So I, Pro I really do believe Protestants believe in mortal sin. They just call it something else. The only difference would be people like Charles Stanley, Robert Wilkins, who believe you will go to heaven even if you become an atheistic serial killer, as long as you had faith once, which is, wow. <laughs> that's the faith alone crowd. That's that's something else for sure. That's one. De that's the one debate James White, Robert Wilkins on faith alone, where I was like, go James White, <laughs> because I mean, like, wow. I mean, I still disagree with White on, on a ton of stuff, but the idea that like you're saved no matter what you do, even if you become an atheistic serial killer, you're still saved. That's so far removed from the Bible. It's it's way way off the field. Mortal sins. Now, there's no list of mortal sins out there. There's no official Catholic list. They, they have the seven deadly sins. That's not an official Catholic list of, of mortal sins, but it's something that they hope gets people closer to the heart of what the issue is. Um, what's a mortal sin? Like, maybe if I look with lust, maybe that's a mortal sin, or maybe it's if I do it this way or that way. And, and it's, they're not entirely sure which sins are mortal sins. To be honest, um, some are clearly mortal sins. If I murder somebody, I've obviously committed a mortal sin. Most of the lists I found where people tried to provide a list, it wasn't official, but it was them trying, included like abortion as, as one of those things. 
but they actually have this sin of presumption, which is presuming that you'll still be saved 10 years from now or even five minutes from now, that that's a sin. And so assurance of salvation to a Catholic is considered arrogant. Why? Well, if you're basing your salvation on your good works, along with faith, then it would be arrogant to just assume that you're going to be good the rest of your life. But if you're basing it on the finished work of Jesus on the cross, then it's not arrogant, it's just faith. Yeah, but remember in Hebrews chapter 10, go to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, it talks about, in Hebrews 10, 26 through 29, talks about how if we sin deliberately after receiving the this, this sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice no longer remains. And Hebrews 10, 28 through 29, talks about how the punishment for leaving the faith, for apostasy, for grave sin under the old law was death. How much worse is it going to be for the person who, who spurns the blood of Christ, under which he was sanctified? So, uh, also, when it comes to this like kind of psychological security, let's see, do I have it here? Yeah, look at what St. Saint, Saint Paul says. He says, I pummel my body and subdue it, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So Paul, writing Corinthians earlier in his pastoral career, he's not, make, he's not being presumptive. He's saying, I could fall away. I could, I could be disqualified. I could lose. I could not be saved. He only had confidence at the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4, when he's, he's, he's about to die, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So when you're like 85 years old in your deathbed or whatever, you're pretty sure like, you know, well, we're here. As long as you don't do something crazy here at the end, you have a lot more moral certainty than you do at the middle or beginning of your, your spiritual life. I'm just trusting you what he's done. Now let me read to you what the Council of Trent came up with. Uh, they said this about salvation. It is given as a reward promised by God himself to be faithfully given to their good works and merits. By those very good works, by those very works, which have been done in God, fully satisfied the divine law according to the state of this life, and to have truly merited or earned eternal life. And you might say to a Catholic, hey, but we're saved by grace. And the Catholic says, yes, that's right, we are. And you go, wait a minute, but you think I'm saved by, you're saved by works. And they go, no, we don't. So, so we're saved by grace. Yes, we are. So grace alone saves. Oh, no, not alone. You need works too. They believe in faith plus grace plus works. It's all of the above. And the thing is, it's weakest link in the chain. And so the works is the thing that becomes the target. This is actually really grievous because if you're Catholic, you have no confidence of, of, of your salvation in Christ. And this is what I want to go out and I want to, I want to reach out to my Catholic friends and family and my neighbors and be like, hey, Jesus paid it all. Look, what? I mean, we both. I'm sure we both agree. A Christian obeys the Ten Commandments. A Christian obeys the Ten Commandments. They don't murder people. They don't commit adultery. They don't commit grave, harmful theft. Uh, you know, there are going to be minor infractions of the Ten Commandments that are not mortal sins. If you take that five cent candy from the store, it's probably not. It's not a mortal sin. But grave violations of the Ten Commandments. Christians don't do that. Pastor Mike would agree, and he would say it's because they are saved. And a Catholic would say it's because they want to remain saved. So it's almost like semantics at this point. But I would say that because the human agency is involved here, the Catholic view just makes more sense in how we describe it. You could be forgiven by his grace. It's not about going to, to the priest and talking into it. You just need Jesus. Every sin covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they say, no, but it's both grace and works. Well, the Bible rejects the concept that you can have grace and works combined. And I want to give you, I've already given you one scripture. Let me give you, let me give you this again. Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And then we'll look at Romans eleven six 6 right after that. God rejects the idea that you can add grace and works and have some combination of the two in order to be saved. And here it is. Now to him who works, Romans 4, 4. To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That you can't have the two. It's one or the other. Works. In fact, Romans eleven six couldn't be... And we already talked about Romans 4, Abraham. That's about the grace given to us at our initial salvation. And Abraham, of course, was justified uh, throughout the course of his life. That's the very, you know, it's, it's, he's justified even after his initial salvation through his works. That's the point of James 2, which we'll get to here shortly, Pastor Mike, not at the length that we should for this discussion. He has a whole video on James 2. Maybe I'll get to that. I'll probably give the good pastor... A break here soon because there's lots of other videos to cover on uh, YouTube, uh, but um, yeah. So uh, let's. But that that's Romans four. It's about initial salvation. Abraham was justified multiple times in his life, and we'll get to that shortly. And his works justified him. Be more clear, even though sometimes you read this, and if you don't read it slowly, it is a little unclear <laughs> because because he's dealing with here a definitional thing. He's defining grace and defining works so that we cannot 
come to the conclusion that it's grace plus works. Romans 11, 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. But what if I combine grace and works? Well, otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If it's grace plus works, it's not grace. Hey, here, you can have my Bible for free. All right, 20 bucks. Well, hold on. Either it's free or I pay for it, but it's not both. You can't mix the two. That's, that's, you're just redefining terms in order to have your new theology. And but no, and what's funny is this almost gets into the Calvinist area here. It's like, you can have my Bible. It's free. Oh, thanks. But then if I never pick up the Bible, if you say, oh, just sign, you just have to sign here to receive it at the front desk. Well, I'm not going to do that. I don't have to do your little ritual. You can't receive it. You have to choose to take it. Or if I walk outside, I got a free Bible, and I throw it in the trash, I don't have a free Bible even, anymore, even though it was a gift. I still have to work to have my Bible, to not throw it away, to not lose it. Uh, so I think the analogy kind of backfires here a bit. We'll get to Romans chapter 11. And it goes on, but if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. If you're laboring for salvation, it is not grace. And if it's grace, it's not labor. And that is the beautiful freedom we have in Jesus Christ that we're saved by grace. Just by grace. And you can say, well, by grace alone. And I was like, well, if grace is with works, it's not grace. So of course it's grace alone, because that's the only kind of grace there is. Free is when you don't pay. <laughs> grace is when you don't work. That's what it means. So such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now they can selectively quote the fathers. Okay, let's talk about Romans 11 then. All right. So what is Paul talking about here? We're saved by grace. Once again, what he's talking about here in Romans 11 is about why are there only a few Jews who have been saved? What about all the others who are not saved? And then these Gentiles who are saved, what in the world is going on here? Paul is explaining to his audience. So Romans 11, verses 5 through 6, he says, there is a remnant. Which Jews are saved? Why are only some Jews saved and not others? Why are only some Jews Christians and not all of them? Why didn't everybody convert? Paul says, because there is a remnant chosen by grace. Initial salvation. Because this remnant, this subset of the Jewish people, were chosen by grace and God. And that they are now, they are Christians. They have the fullness of salvation. Why? And people say, well, did they do something for God to choose them? Remember, initial salvation. Yes, we are initially saved by grace alone. But it doesn't mean our actions have nothing to do with the remainder of our salvific life. It doesn't mean that. So what Paul says, well, why were these people chosen? He says they're chosen by grace. Did they do something for God to pick these Jews and not these other Jews to become Christians? But if it is by grace, and by the way, and I affirm, of course, that God wants everyone to be saved. He may give more grace or less grace to other people, but he wants all people to be saved. But Paul's wondering, why are only some Christian and not all the other Jews? Did they? Maybe they did something to be saved. No. But if it is by grace, it is no longer works. On the basis, it is no longer the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. That's what Romans 4 and Romans 11, 5 through 6 are getting at. The grace we, re we merely receive and don't merit through works at our initial salvation. And, but just a few verses later, Romans 11, what I mentioned earlier, that you can choose to reject this grace later. So you have one work, don't throw away the grace. God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Faith saves. Faith saves. James 2 talks about how uh, Abraham was justified, it says, by works. But it's speaking of justification in the eyes of man. In other words, how do you prove to me that you're saved? How do you prove to me your faith? You show me with works. So works are, the, again, the evidence of faith. Read James 2 in context. He's not talking about how you get saved. He's talking about how you show you're saved. I will show you my faith by my works. That's what he says. That's even Protestant scholars reject this interpretation of James chapter 2. Thomas Schreiner wrote a book, A Defense of Sola Fide. Uh, Schreiner is a well-known Reformed theologian. And this is what he says about this interpretation of Abraham, saying, well, justified by works means in the eyes of men. He says, there is no evidence that justification here relates to justification before people rather than God. When James uses the words save and justify, he has in mind one's relationship with God. Now, Schreiner has his own way of trying to explain this text, but even he will say that when it says that you're justified by works, oh, well, that's to men, not to God. No, it refers to God. That's what James is talking about here. It's not what our works don't get us into heaven, but they do increase our righteousness for God because we are his children and we obey him, and through his grace we do the good works that have been prepared for us. Not, not, it will exist because of works. Uh, but it's still faith that saves, and it is dead faith, or fake, you might call it fake faith, <laughs> that doesn't save, because um, real faith will end up producing works, but the works don't save. That's just a natural result. Another verse that they'll quote sometimes, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, says this, and uh, we're almost done here, but I wanted to get a couple of the verses you'll hear quoted to combat 
all of the scriptures I quoted, and there's so much more um, that talk about free salvation through belief. Um, Therefore, my, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, and here's the, here's the part, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this scripture was given to me once, and I was just like, oh, uh, I never, uh, I read Philippians, but I don't remember noticing that, like, oh, wow. And I was much younger, and I was like, kind of like, wow, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I thought, well, it says work out, it doesn't say work for, and so I, there, there's something different there. But, and there is, and of course, work out means like a math problem, like, you know, figure out whether you're saved or not. But verse 13 was ignored, and verse 13 in Philippians 2, the next verse, it says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So again, I find it's God working in me to let me see the evidence of the salvation in my life. So work it out. Are you really saved? Well, look at your life. Do you? I'll continue, but it's not either God saves us that we're some kind of marionette puppets and God just animates us, or we work and we get ourselves to save through our own initiative. Grace works together so that we work out our salvation by letting God, by letting God work through us for the works that he has prepared for us. You see yourself following Jesus or are you you living after the flesh? In which case, not work harder to be saved, but get saved so that you can see the works. They're a result. They're a result. Or seeing if I really am saved, what behavior should I be engaging in? I mean, we're saying the same thing. We're saying a Christian has faith in Christ and he obeys the Ten Commandments. And it's just the order of these things where we're disagreeing on that is is the problem. So we we are closer than we than we think. At least at least I think because Pastor Mike is not a Calvinist. So I think we're actually pretty close. We probably agree on free will, and at least like I think he doesn't think you can lose your salvation, but he, he thinks you could probably reject salvation up front and choose to not be Christian, even if God gave you grace to do that. Uh, he doesn't. I don't think he believes in irresistible grace. So continue. Result. So the conclusion so far as we uh, kind of end for today, there is no validation for the Roman Catholic claims to authority. There's none, none, nothing that really validates it. Authority would be the only reason to embrace the extra biblical teachings of the Catholic Church if they have the authority to say that stuff. So we need to reject the papacy. We've got to get back to the word of God like Jesus wants us to. Okay, and I think the rest of this, he just summarizes the um, the video and what he is um, taught from that. So, well, that was... Uh, Part three, I know it, it took a little while to, to get through this, but I think it's helpful. At the very least, it's a kind of neat way to learn theology and learn about the Catholic faith by seeing how others comment on it and how a Catholic might respond. So if you have other ideas for videos or people you'd like to see me do a response to, put them in the comment section below. If you want to see more videos like this, uh, and if you want to hear more of my thoughts on different matters, check out my podcast. You can get it for free at iTunes and Google Play. Just search for the Council of Trent right here, you know, Council of Trent. Uh, if you would like to support the podcast and get access to bonus content, go to trenthornpodcast.com. So thank you all so much, and I hope you have a, a very blessed day.